Thank you, Paul. My language is okay. My journey with this amazing team as a volunteer doctor at Best Year 2021. Listening to Serpan music, to checking on ourselves, and some acclimatization hike, our body was well acclimatized. This amazing view of mountain, snow topped path, and music of yak bells. That was amazing. When we reached Everest Base Camp, Serpas were already in their duty. Together we built tent and clinic. We checked and expired medicines, damaged medicines, and discarded them. Medicines and boxes were well labeled, and finally we were ready to on the clinic. Maintaining everyone's safety, we examined different cases. Some were mild, some were moderate, and some were severe enough, requiring evacuation to Kathmandu. This is the first time rescue of the season, a case of open femoral fracture. We were able to evacuate him safely to Kathmandu and he recovered. We also participated in the worship ceremony of Mount Chamanungma, wishing for everyone safe submit. I was so proud of the camp leaders who initiated posters as no entry, a compulsion of marks. There was a limited moment during the season. Apart from these, we were served variety of food. Food was delicious. And so was the birthday at that altitude. Escape. Before preparing ourselves to bed, hot water is must. But the night looks different. As you can hear the sound of wind. But in no time, things become normal. This is our morning alarm. Every morning, water is frozen, but the view is breathtaking. And every day is not the same. Some days are very cold and heavy snowfall. During those days, um, I prefer to paint or stay inside. I keep myself busy. I love to dance, to warm myself and keep everyone happy. I feel lucky to be pampered and give a chance uh, to learn uh, ice climbing by an expert. As I say, amazing team means amazing journey. I also got a chance to visit Pumori High Camp with the guide. Isn't it a great journey? Some days were high and some were low. Overall, great experience it was. Thank you. That was a fantastic video. I love that. I love that. <laughs> really gave us a good, a good look at what goes on. That's awesome. So that is uh, all about my experience at uh, Everest. I hope you all enjoyed it. So now I think uh, let's move, move on the case that I um, treated during my case uh, during my stay at the base camp. So this is the case of uh, Bell's palsy that I um, uh, examined. So he is a 38 year old uh, previously healthy man who visited Everest Emergency Clinic early in the morning with three hour history of left sided facial droop with no pain or tingling sensation over that area. He denied history of uh, uh, like hearing loss or other ear problems, loss of taste and other like illnesses like maybe respiratory or viral illnesses. Similarly, he had no past significant past medical history. Uh, he, but however, he had been working at Everest Best Camp as a chef for a three month period. On examination, on, on presentation, he was comfortable, well oriented to time, place and person. His vitals were normal and systemic examination was unremarkable. As, uh, as you can see on local examination of his face, uh, when we asked him uh, to cleanse his teeth, uh, the face was deviated to left side. Similarly, he was unable to whistle. And uh, when we asked to protrude his tongue, he was unable to, uh, to protrude the tongue. Uh, it was deviated to left side. And uh, on, on um, uh, frowning his uh, forehead, he was unable to uh, wrinkle. Uh, there was no wrinkles on, on the right side. However, the sensation was uh, equal on bilateral face. Uh, uvula was centrally located. Trossiers and soft six signs were negative. Looking onto all of these and considering the clinical um, uh, only clinical examinations, we diagnosed this case as a case of Bell's palsy. We managed him with four mg of single dose of dexamethasone, uh, and um, we kept him uh, for an hour of close observation. And during that time, he developed no any complaints. Similarly, we also advised him to evacuate uh, to uh, other health centers um, for further investigations and to rule out other causes of sudden unilateral facial drop. However, he was reluctant to seek further care and uh, he, since uh, the season was also clo closing, so he decided to stay at base camp for mo three more days. At base camp, we managed him with regular steroid, eye drops and eye care. 
After three days, he returned to his village, which uh, lies at altitude of 2,000 meter. And uh, I regularly followed him by phone. He uh, shared with me some of his pictures about his like uh, facial, about his fish, uh, how improved they were. And uh, on seven days, uh, uh, the, the deformity was completely recovered. So here is the photo that I share with you all. Um, he's, um, the uh, photo before uh, the, uh, when he first visited Everest year and uh, the one after seven weeks. So after seven weeks, uh, the position of his uh, mouth was uh, normal. His tongue was also normal in position. He was able to whistle and also there was a normal bilateral wrinkle on the forehead. So here on uh, the discussion part, I'd like to say, sure, as we all know, Bell's palsy, it is an acute mononeuropathy, one of the most common cause of facial palsy that affects 11.5 to 53.3 per uh, 1 lakh individuals a year across different populations. Among many other causes, uh, like viral infections, tumors, Guillain-Barre syndrome, cold, vitamin D deficiency, hypoxia, high altitude cerebral edema, are the altitude related cases and we need to consider these cases at high altitude. So in our case, uh, it could be because of vitamin D deficiency as um, he is a cook and he stays, uh, he tends to stay more inside, it is cold and he also wears um, like many layers of clothes. So it could be uh, vitamin D deficiency, but uh, since we lack investigation, we cannot confirm this. Uh, similarly, um, the hydrocellular edema is unlikely in this case uh, because um, he was already there for three weeks, for sorry, for three months, and he saw no symptoms and signs of symptoms suggestive of hydrocellular edema. Uh, but uh, but uh, as uh, suggested by uh, research done by Zan et al. in 2019, it says that uh, the people living in cold are more likely to develop Bell's palsy than those living in hot environment. So it could be because of cold, one of the probable reason. Uh, so we need to consider these things when we are at high altitude. Um, as um, uh, places like um, at high altitude or remote areas, we always lack uh, uh, enough diagnostic tools. So in that condition, uh, sometimes our case may get may have may develop some other complications or it may bring some poor outcomes. So to prevent that and to uh, to um, to decrease the diagnostic dilemma, we should always uh, go for the clinical uh, diagnosis. So that is what we did in our case. Uh, like uh, we rule out, uh, like we, we rule out the other cause, other probable causes of facial palsy, like trauma or uh, viral infection or congenital or neoplasia. So um, uh, as uh, the study done by Heckman et al. in 2019, the mainstay of treatment is corticosteroids. So that is what we gave in our case. And uh, also, um, we need to stress uh, on uh, some of the things that is like if uh, the patient presents with uh, features such as like uh, high cerebral edema or non altitudinated um, neural swelling or hypoxia, in that condition, uh, immediate descent is very important. And we need to uh, uh, ask the patient to descend immediately and help them. Similarly, um, as vitamin D is also one of the risk factor for Bell's palsy at high altitude, um, it is very important, I think, to educate uh, the locals, climbers, and porters, and even encourage them uh, to um, use fortified food so that uh, we can prevent um, vitamin D deficiency and uh, further Bell's palsy. These are the references. And uh, so this is all about my presentation for today. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. That was a good differential for, so I'm hoping we have some medical students here today. Um, and I kind of want to tell. Just really briefly open up the floor for a little bit of discussion. Um, so one question I have for any of our medical students here, what about this patient's case um, made you think it was Bell's palsy? Um, it, there was there was one really distinguishing feature that Dr. Peldell, um pointed out. Any anybody want to pipe up? Any thoughts? No, oh, everybody's shy this morning. Oh, I got it. I got a chat here, and I think it's anonymous. Forehead involvement. That's right. So. So you saw the forehead sparing on that picture. Those were great pictures. Um, and I, I know Sangeeta, probably a lot of the docs up there run into this. It seems like it's very hard to convince people to descend when they're having a problem. Is that is that something run into a lot? Yes. 
yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's hard to it's hard to talk people out of the mountains even when they're sick. But um, yeah, that was a that was a great case. Thank you so much. Does does anybody um have any other questions for Sangeeta? No, everybody's still waking up in Did in the do? U.S. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate was, it. Was your follow up um, with the patient all like basically telehealth through FaceTime or Zoom or something like that? I noticed you had some really good follow up pictures. Yes, uh, uh, I I did video call with him, uh, like in a week interval, and um, when uh, I, I I felt like he was completely recovered, then I asked him to take his photos and send it to me. So that is how awesome. I made uh, the photos like before and after. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, all right. Well, kind of what we're going to do is we're going to just, um, the other presenters, we, we're just going to kind of cycle through cases. So I'd like to start with um, Dr. Karki, if he would like to present one of his cases, and then then we can kind of just take turns presenting cases and until we've until we've run out of time. I know time goes by really quickly on these presentations, and I don't want to keep everyone too long, but really looking forward to hearing from you guys. So, Dr. Karki, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Ginner. Um, I was hoping we might have some fresh uh, attitude-related cases because my case is also not a very typical attitude related cases, but I'm hoping to share some um, interesting pictures uh, of frostbite and um, some eye cases from altitude, um, um, if time permits. Uh, um, would you be able to make me a co-host so I can share my screen? You should be able to already. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, thank you for your time and showing up this morning. And from Nepal, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm Pawan Karki. I'm a, a first year EM resident here in Virginia Tech EM residency program. I'm also a member of Mountain Medicine Society of Nepal, um, and I was fortunate uh, to be able to join Everest ER as a volunteer in 2019. Um, <clears throat> I also had uh, presented some of these cases uh, last year when we did um, uh, our virtual case presentation case series, and uh, if some of that is redundant, uh, uh, my apologies, but I think uh, I'm trying to focus on this one particular case where we uh, face some uh, challenges while we're trying to rescue a trauma case from uh, Everest um, to the Kathmandu. And I just wanted to kind of set lights on what are the major challenges in in field of uh, helicopter rescue um, from the base camp in around, around in Nepal. Um, so uh, this is the case of a fall. Um, uh, this was a 36 year old uh, Sherpa uh, who was actually uh, making his rotation um, from the higher camps to the base camp. So uh, the way it works uh, during the climbing season is uh, uh, the climbers, they do two or three rotation for acclimatization. So they go up to camp three and uh, come down to the base camp and they try to do it twice at least to try to acclimatize for, for camp four and summit push. But the, but the Sherpa who carry the, uh, uh, the all the equipments and gears, they had to do this rotation multiple times. And the, the way to the uh, these higher camps, uh, like you can see, go through these crevasses. And sometimes there are as many as 100 crevasses that and joining like multiple ladders. And this is a path. And uh, this, this fall was um, higher than the camp two. So it was between camp two and camp three. So that part of the, of, of the uh, road is uh, pretty much inclined um, almost 70 to 80 degrees um, at places. Uh, so it's almost vertical um, where you just have to uh, just clip to the road, uh, clip to the rope and just keep uh, climbing that uh, slope and this, um, uh, our our uh, friend, uh, he 
he was trying to unclip and then clip under the another part of the rope and he somehow stumbled and then took a fall and that was claimed by the people who saw it was the, probably the highest fall they've seen around 400 meters so that's um i'm sorry exactly i do not know what that's in the feet but yeah it's 400 meters um so pretty high um so it was not a free fall but um uh, so it was in a climbing climb plane of around um 70 80 degrees so he uh, rolled over and had um, this fall at places he hit his head um and it was combination of free falls with possible face impacts and he had multiple impacts when he reached uh, the the end of the fall and that was close to camp two uh, so um as he fell um luckily it was the daytime and there were many other um uh, teams that were doing these rotations and they were able to see him and were able to quickly reach to him and then he was brought from the the base of that slope to the camp two. So camp two is a uh, only place uh, I think um, that that has a, a place for good helicopter landing. Um, anything above camp two has uh, doesn't really have a place for, uh, to land. So it has to be a um, um, a long line rescue. So since he was closer to uh, camp two, they were able to get him there with support of uh, other team members and. Um, the we got a call from the um, from the the leader of the, the the team that was involved in this and they wanted us to be ready uh, from Everest ER <clears throat> in the Everest ER helipad in the base camp because uh, they they informed us that they had a he had a fall and he was going to be brought down to the base camp first uh, to have a, a primary assessment and then uh, likely a quick rescue to uh, Kathmandu as soon as we can so um we were three doctors in the base camp uh, that season and uh, we are generally instructed um that we should not leave the base camp um, um unless it's an uh, it's a dire situation so i think this was one of those dire situation where um we had to um and uh, dr dionarian who was um, um my colleague at the time decided that he he was uh, willing to um to go to with the climber if needed and he was um available in the helipad uh for the for the climber to do a primary survey and just make a plan and then um, probably accompany him uh, in the rescue <clears throat> uh, so um just just giving you an idea of how these rescue take place are uh, these are um pretty much commercial helicopters. Um, they do not have a medical team. They are just pilot and they have to be sometimes stripped down to be able to go up to that height of camp two and camp three. And uh, many times it's just pilot and one rescue uh, specialist. And um, I'm just going to play this clip. Um, hopefully it will support. And this is our um, uh, rescue specialist, uh, Mr. Lakpa Sherpa. So he was um, the fourth member of our team and uh, he's been in every season um, since Everest ER was started and he has done multiple rescue. And this was not the, the, this patient, but this is one of those um, the rescue he just likes to go and he was like this hopping in and out of helicopter and just wanted to show how he does that. And I really respect what he does and this probably um, one of those moments was where he like does what he does. So that's a helicopter that was hovering in front of every CR, just waiting for him to get his equipment. So he just throws his skid and just hops into a helicopter that's not even tossing down um, like a taxi or something just done so many times. And um, uh, you can see it's just a commercial helicopter with some uh, just some passenger seat that's been turned down to make some space for 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 the rescue uh, that's me and dr yogesh uh, uh, just waiting for the them to come down and uh, anything above cam 3 uh, cam 2 has to be brought down with a long line technique and there are very few people who can do that in Nepal and likewise, luckily one of those people. And this is um, 
not a um, not, not the patient that we're talking about today. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the videos from that patient, but this is uh, another time when we had another person come down um, in a long line um, rescue, and this was a warp cam too, so it had to be brought down. So it involves a person um, getting down in a helicopter on a road. So, uh, so that was uh, Lakpa again. Um, so he has done uh, hundreds of these long run rescue. Uh, big shout out to him. And uh, um, so uh, anything above camp two has to be done with this technique. And it's so it, it takes a lot of uh, uh, um, risk for anyone who's trying to um, rescue someone who's uh, above base camp or above camp two, and a lot of uh, you know, challenges when doing that. Uh, so uh, the our patient uh, was brought down um, from camp to the base camp. Um, uh, he was seen at the base camp, and in in the initial um, um, assessment, uh, we made a diagnosis that uh, he had some extensive facial fractures uh, based on what we could see, see and possible spinal injury. Uh, though we were uh, not able to uh, really assess it because uh, he was uh, non non responsive at that time, but uh, we suspected that. Uh, based on the height and the mechanism of injury. Uh, so we uh, decided to um, uh, transport him Im immediately to the Kathmandu because uh, uh, he had some uh, some serious injuries and Dr. Uh, Dionarian, he uh, decided to accompany the patient to Kathmandu. So on, on assessment, um, um, his airway was possibly un unstable. So that's the, the, the thing that we start from. Um, you're in the base camp with um, very less uh, equipment. And, uh, and this is the place where you have to kind of um, um, modify whatever you can do. Um, we may not be able to follow the full ATLS protocol and just uh, start with intubation because uh, you may be able to get the tube in, but what next? There is um, no respiratory therapist there. There is no ventilators. Uh, you, the, there is very limited uh, medication that you can use, and um, and you, you do not know what what support you have. So it has to be a very diligent uh, decision. Um, I, I think uh, Doctor uh, Denise he was um, he was quite convinced that the patient at this point is breathing spontaneously, and he will just support the airway manually and just go from there. Um, Intubating at this point would, would have been a, the, the, the best um, go-to as per ATLS protocol, but we decided that uh, we'll just getting that done in the, in the, in the base camp um, might not be the best option uh, given the resources we had. So he, we just decided to um, manually maintain the airway as well as the cervical spine because uh, he was on the back of a helicopter um, and that's going to be a two hour journey from a base camp to Kathmandu. Um, and then he's the only person in the, with the patient. Um, so it was pretty challenging for him. And um, um, so he decided to go with the manual uh, stabilization and was um, uh, he's, uh, on the, on the, on the further assessment. Uh, he did have a bilateral peripheral pulses palpable and femoral pulses palpable. He just was again, he was not responsive, um, uh, not opening eyes to um, any stimuli, non responsive, um, but we had some, um, some motion. So um, his GC was pretty low. Um, um, and on secondary survey, he did uh, have some blunt force trauma to his uh, uh, frontoparietal regions. Um, there was some suspicion for CSF rhinorrhea, though we're not sure, and um, blood in his oral cavity and chest confusion. So you're already thinking this is not going to be the best day for the uh, to be a, 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 a doctor in a wilderness. Um, luckily, it didn't turn out that bad. So we were able to... Um, um, get him down and this, in the same helicopter that we, we saw a moment back. So it was a passenger helicopter. So the only three people in the helicopter were the pilot who was in charge of helicopter and then Dr. Denise, uh, Dionarian, and then uh, the patient. 
Um, so he, uh, throughout the, um, his road, uh, Dr. Dinesh was able to man maintain the C-spine in line with his uh, manually and was doing jaw thrust, C and lift, uh, whatever he could with the support of uh, oropharyngeal airway to maintain the airway. Uh, so he was, uh, so again, another challenge, uh, getting this helicopter down to the Lukla. I don't know what was exactly the reason, but patient had to be moved to a different helicopter at Lukla. So Lukla is basically the place where the airport is and any any helicopter or any flight that comes in uh, has to uh, touch down on Lukla. Most of the times uh, we're able to get in the same helicopter, but I don't know if it's a fuel thing or um, something else, or sometimes it's even a um, um, insurance uh, thing. Um, so it was changed. Um, and from uh, Lukla to Kathmandu, um, it was pretty uneven for uh, Dr. Dinesh, again, maintaining the uh, C-spine on his own and supporting his airway. Uh, the whole time patient was able to breathe by himself. And um, uh, the helicopter was basically just him um, supporting his um, you know, the patient's airway and no other uh, adjuncts, um, there were no devices on board. Uh, so a quite uh, long uh, 20 minute uh, of um, a 40 minute ride from from, from Lukla to uh, to the Kathmandu. And from Kathmandu, uh, he was uh, transferred uh, to a um, tertiary care hospital. Um, uh, that was that was a 20 minute ride uh, on, a, on a traffic day. So on uh, arrival to the hospital, and that was the first time he got a definitive care. Um, uh, there he was uh, treated as per ATLS protocol, was stabilized, resuscitated, um, and a CT scan was done. So the CT scan did show that he would have some, um, he had uh, skull fractures in his uh, right front rotopedal region, uh, orbital wall fracture, maxillary sinus, uh, was, there was uh, hemosinus <clears throat> and other, uh, other bone fractures. Um, there's, he also had an EDS, so he uh, underwent a, a, a decompressive craniotomy um, <clears throat> and there were uh, some findings of the of fractures in the interrogatory finding as well. Uh, basically, the EDS was evacuated, uh, his uh, uh, scalp was repaired, <clears throat> he was admitted to the ICU and he made a miraculous recovery. He recovered and was discharged within a week. Uh, he is alive and doing his job. Uh, I haven't been able to get in touch with him. Um, I tried, uh, but I, I heard from one of his colleagues that he's back in his uh, uh, job with minimal deficits. So that was, I think he was a pretty, pretty lucky guy. So let's just talk about what, what things, all the things that went wrong here, uh, the things that went right. Uh, uh, so basically the, all the, uh, rescues in uh, from the base camp take place in one of these kind of helicopters. These are uh, Aerospital um, B3 helicopters. Uh, they are uh, designed to go to a high, very high altitude, but they are pretty um, compact. So they do not have uh, uh, much space, and sometimes they have to be stripped down uh, in order to uh, operate and, and go higher up. So we are already limited on what things we can have on board, um, and and that limits the, the, the medical equipment and sometimes even on even pretty limited oxygen. Um, so the other challenges is that there is no um, de dedicated medical rescue helicopter. So these um, uh, rescue operates basically through insurance companies and uh, they are in charge of it. So we are already thinking, okay, maybe this is not the best idea because uh, they will do whatever is most feasible for them or whichever hospital they think is the best for them. And the whole decision is made by um, the insurance company. And uh, so, and uh, the helicopters are not equipped. Uh, they, they are not prepared for this. They have pretty basic first aid kits and, um, and they are extremely cramped for a medical person to work on. Um, and that was probably one of the reasons why we decided we, sh we should be very, um, um, try to limit as much as we can and not get very aggressive with treatment because we have very limited resources here. And uh, yeah, that was the case. I just, um, um, are, you, are we at a good place to maybe uh, go through some eye cases or should we save them for later and uh, have some other presenters present because that was a case that I uh, decided to present.
Yeah, that was a great case. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that he survived. That really is miraculous. <laughs> that's that's unbelievable. And and discharged within a week. That's that's awesome. Wow. So I just had a, I had a quick question about the airway. Um, you said he had manual airway stabilization. I think you said he had an oropharyngeal airway. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And then do you have, was he, was he bagged at all? Or was he just, just kind of manually maintained with a, with the oral airway? So he wasn't bagged. He was, uh, he was breathing throughout this procedure. Like, um, um, so I think uh, he was not that uh, neurologically, he was not that bad, uh, even though his uh, GCS was um, five or six. Uh, his, the initial GCS was uh, slightly worse. And as I think, as he went to Kathmandu, maybe it was uh, um, maybe getting down or something. It was, he was more um, responsive as he went down and uh, was able to maintain the airway um, uh, throughout the journey. That's amazing. That's awesome. Well, I think, I think probably what we should do, we'll just keep cycling through. I'll see if um, either Abiu or um, Dr. Carell is, is ready. Um, to, to give one of their cases. And then kind of once we cycle through everybody, I'd love to, we'd love yeah, to hear sure. about the eye condition too. We'll just kind of see how much time we have, if that's all right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Dr. Karki worked all night in the ER last night and he was kind enough to stay up and, um, and be here with us. So I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Carrell, would you would you like to go next? Are are you ready? We can't we can't hear you. I'm afraid you may have to turn on your microphone. Prakash, we still can't hear you. We can see your screen. Um, Prakash, perhaps while you're figuring out your, um, your microphone, maybe we could let Abiyu, um, Dr. Gmire, um, present a case and then, um, you can be ready after that. Is that okay? All right, uh, uh, Dr. Gamira, would you be would you be ready to um, present one of your cases? Uh oh, maybe having some tech. There he is. Maybe having some technical difficulties here. Um, All right. It's always hard. Am I Good online? Morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> and it's, it's clear that I've had some difficulties with the time zones here, but so glad you could join us. Yeah, it's, it's more like evening up, up here. Uh, yeah, so namaste, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Avyu, and uh, this right here Andrea, is uh, Mr. Pasang Chiri, uh, my partner in crime. And uh, are, are, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, all right. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so uh, uh, all right. So maybe I can share my screen and and we can get into the presentation. Uh, so uh, first of all, yeah, Abby, can you just tell us really briefly about where you work and um, kind of kind of your your practice, just a, really really quickly. 
Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, I'm, I've been working uh, in Kumbu for over uh, six years now, and uh, I was trained in India. Uh, although I'm, I'm a Nepalese uh, citizen, uh, I went to India and then got my medical education there. Uh, came back to Nepal, uh, worked in uh, far west Nepal for a bit, for a few months. And after that, since, uh, since the end of 2016, I've been uh, involved with the Mountain Medical Institute, which is located in Namchi Bazar. So, uh, yeah, this is a, a clinic uh, where we uh, see patients and we have a uh, remote clinic branch up at Dingboche. So that we have two, um, uh, two places where we see patients. And uh, yeah, so I, I shuttle between these two locations and and uh, see patients and uh, try to help in whatever way I can. Yeah, so that's a little bit about myself. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so. Uh, show present review. Okay, so uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see you. Uh, all right, so, so let me begin. Uh, namaste and Ashidele. I'm, I'm Dr. Aviv, and this is my presentation about my personal experience dealing with uh, COVID in the mountains. Uh, a note of acknowledgement to Dr. Ken Zafrin. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if he's here or not. I, I was a, late, a bit late to join this uh, presentation. Um, uh, but if he's uh, watching, then yeah, so thanks to you, uh, Dr. Ken Zafrin, uh, who has not only assisted me with this presentation, but has also helped me manage uh, many other confusing uh, medical cases. All right, so uh, if you have any questions, doubts, or uh, suggestions, uh, feel free to write them down on the chat and uh, I shall probably address them at the end. Um, uh, okay, so let's get into the presentation. Uh, there was no PCR testing available back in 2020. Uh, well, we still don't have PCR testing, but we do get uh, rapid antigen tests uh, nowadays. Uh, we had to come up with a way to differentiate COVID from uh, other forms of cough and cold solely based on clinical presentation. Um, and, and there are a lot of different kinds of cough and cold uh, in Kumbu, uh, respiratory tract infections uh, other than COVID, uh, hape, high altitude pulmonary edema, uh, allergic cough, uh, Kumbu cough, uh, or irritative cough, uh, to mention a few. Uh, so this is a two-page document uh, that, that anyone can use, uh, honestly. So, uh, so they, they could use this document while dealing with COVID uh, in a rural setting. Uh, the disease could be uh, categorized into uh, seven stages, each stage having certain clinical features, uh, kind of like a triage system. The guidelines would provide uh, simple instructions on managing each stage in, uh, in a resource limited uh, setting. Uh, statistically speaking, out of 100 people infected with uh, COVID, uh, 50 are asymptomatic. Uh, about 30% have mild to moderate uh, symptoms. Uh, about 15 require oxygen and roughly 1 to 2% end up dying. Uh, these stats are for uh, the Delta variant, of course. Uh, the one we are dealing with uh, at that time, uh, and not not Omicron, which is uh, which is way milder. Omicron is uh, uh, benign. Uh, anyway, uh, in, in spring season 2021, when uh, Kumbu had just opened up to tourists, uh, we we at uh, MMI Dingboche Clinic, we were all all prepared, geared up for the worst uh, with oxygen concentrators, dexamethasone, and and whatnot. Uh, uh, over 350 uh, patients with COVID uh, were encountered uh, over a period of three months. Uh, none needed to be helicopter evacuated, and uh, no one no one died. Okay, so according to the statistics, uh, at least seven were supposed to die. Uh, roughly 100 individuals infected should have needed oxygen. Uh, but surprisingly, everyone recovered well, and, and this was uh, this was quite uh, astonishing for us to witness. 
rewind back to 2020. Uh, this was uh, when COVID just broke out. Uh, the disease was new to us. Uh, no one knew what it was all about. Uh, there was a scene of chaos in the villages, uh, conspiracy theories flying around, and uh, people not wanting visitors, uh, uh, hide your kids, hide your wives, uh, you know, that kind of situation. So uh, we conducted this uh, public awareness campaign uh, with the uh, help from Pasanglam Rural Municipality and uh, COVID Safe uh, Mountain Tourism. Uh, our, our team consists of uh, Mr. Raj Gewali. Uh, he's, uh, he has joined our uh, presentation here. Uh, Mr. Amrit Ali, who is who's right now climbing uh, Lobuche as we speak. Uh, Achuming Magaljan. So I think, I think he's also in the chat and, uh, and myself. Uh, uh, we went from village to village telling people to not be scared, but instead follow simple precautionary measures. Okay, on the left, uh, that's a PPE demonstration we conducted at Namche Bazaar. Uh, and on the right, that's uh, Kumjum. So we, we, we conducted these uh, public awareness campaigns uh, in almost every village. Uh, on the left, that's Tengboche Monastery um, and uh, Dingboche on the right. We can see Rajdai striking a pose here. Um, actually, something worth mentioning happened at the monastery. Uh, there were there were five monks who were infected, and uh, the head monk, his uh, His Holiness, uh, they were in Boche. Uh, he 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 uh, didn't want to take medications. He was he was very skeptical about uh, Western medicine, especially antibiotics. Uh, that would kill bacteria in his body uh, and any form of killing is, is a big no in Buddhism. Uh, it was really difficult to convince him. So what I said was uh, that even, even Dalai Lama destroys uh, sand mandalas. You know, sand mandalas are like pieces of art. Um, so even Dalai Lama would destroy sand mandalas after completing them. Uh, there can be no creation without destruction. Uh, there can be no, no life without death. Uh, I can't save your life without having to kill a few bugs in your body. Uh, let me bear the burden of this sin. Uh, please have the medicine, your, high, uh, your holiness. And, and well, he did have the medicine finally and, and uh, recovered well. Uh, okay, so that's a, that's a nice little story from, from the first wave. Uh, moving on to the second wave, 2021. Uh, news broke out that some of the climbers at uh, Everest Peace Camp were infected. Uh, it was all over the news, uh, even in DDC. Uh, and in, uh, an invigilation program was organized and, and we headed out to find, uh, find out what, what was actually going on at uh, Everest Peace Camp. Uh, on our 20-day COVID-19 invigilation program, we visited various places in the upper Kumbu region. Uh, including Chukung, uh, Lobuche, uh, Gorokshep, uh, and, and even uh, Everest ER. Uh, that's us sitting inside uh, Everest ER. In the picture from left to right, the person with the funky looking glasses uh, is our ward chairperson, uh, Mr. Lakshman Adhikari. Uh, in the back, we have uh, Everest ER team in blue jackets, uh, starting from left, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Podal, Dr. Suraj Shreshta, uh, Achyu Lakpa Norbu uh, in the red jacket, uh, and Dr. Prakash Karel. Uh, then there's me, um, and then uh, to my left is uh, our lab assistant, Mr. Pasang Shiring, uh, uh, who's also sitting here beside me right now. Um, and finally, uh, leftmost is uh, Mr. Kamal, uh, Kamal Kotwal, our security personnel. Uh, a little bit about uh, how COVID outbreaks uh, occurred uh, in the mountains. Uh, villages in Kumbu are, are isolated communities uh, and by default, uh, they don't have COVID. So uh, uh, all of a sudden there's a sporadic case and, and before you know, the whole village gets infected. Uh, a medical response team has to be promptly organized and dispatched to the location where the outbreak has happened. Uh, this might be a few days walk from the nearest clinic. Uh, we went house to house conducting an antigen tests, uh, triaging patients, uh, giving medications. Uh, on the left, you can see that's Forche, where I visited this old man. And on the right, that's uh, Chukung, where uh, an antigen test is being conducted. Uh, on one such occasion, a patient was suffering from uh, COVID uh, ARDS, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, the patient needed uh, immediate transfer to a higher medical center. 
uh, sadly, the weather was not so favorable and the, and the requested helicopter could not arrive. Uh, the patient needed oxygen until evacuation was possible. Uh, we received information that uh, there were two huge abandoned cylinders at Namche Bazaar. Uh, these are industrial grade uh, gases brought by some, some researchers uh, left abandoned at the helipad. Uh, in Namche, uh, not not medical uh, oxygen, but uh, whatever works works, right? So, uh, so one of these uh, two cylinders contained uh, oxygen, and the other possibly nitrogen. Uh, now, now we had to figure out uh, which is which because we don't want to give uh, a patient with uh, a low saturation of nitrogen. We we want to give them oxygen, right? So, uh, some some backyard science over here. Uh, do not write this at home if, if by any chance you have uh, abandoned cylinders lying around. Uh, having a flame next to an oxygen cylinder might be quite dangerous. Uh, so what we did was held a burning matchstick to the nozzle of the cylinders. Uh, on the left, you can see that the oxygen uh, uh, is eating combustion and the flame burns vigorously. Uh, that's the left. Uh, so the left cylinder uh, must be oxygen. Uh, whereas on the right, uh, the flame is almost instantly put out by nitrogen. Uh, now that we had identified the oxygen cylinder, it was uh, mounted onto a stretcher, uh, as, as you can see here uh, in this footage. Um, so much like carrying a patient, yeah? So we mounted the cylinder onto a stretcher. Uh, and then... Uh, we we carried it up, up the uh, carried the cylinder up the mountain. Uh, there's a there's a saying in uh, Nepali that uh, if you are thirsty or dehydrated, uh, you have to go to a river. Uh, the river most certainly wouldn't come to you. Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. So if you're thirsty, you have to go to a tap or a river, and then the river won't come to you. Uh, this is one of those instances where the saying does not hold true. Uh, here we are taking turns to take the river to the one who is thirsty. Uh, by river, I mean, mean to say oxygen, and uh, by the one who is thirsty, I mean to say uh, the patient. After two days, uh, there was a weather window, and the patient uh, was evacuated uh, to a tertiary care center in Kathmandu. Uh, on the right, you can see that the saturation of the patient uh, was in the 30s. Uh, uh, it was quite an adventure, uh, this whole COVID uh, pandemic, uh, lots of small stories and experiences that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Uh, and, 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 with, and with that, uh, we come to the end of this presentation. All right, thank you. Avi, that was, that was amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love the story about the monk. That was good. That was good. Um, you know, patient counseling. I I've never had to encounter anything like that. I don't think any of us have, but that was awesome. Um, and thank you so much for your presentation. Well, um, thank you. does anybody have any, any, any quick questions, um, for Dr. Gamire before we move on to Dr. Carl's case? I have a quick question. Um, could you, like you talked early on about, you know, recognizing uh, COVID clinically without the possible use of antigen tests or PCRs. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about those techniques or ways, especially now since uh, COVID has much fewer symptoms and thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I could uh, talk, uh, talk about it a bit. So uh, uh, we, we went through a lot of uh, papers and, and uh, we, we identified what's the most common symptoms. Uh, so we, we formulated this triad of uh, symptoms. Uh, so initially it's a dry, dry cough and fever and, and a viral syndrome. Yeah, so, uh, so if you want, I could forward it to you. If you're interested, it's, uh, it's not a long read. Uh, I might have it somewhere here. And probably I might be able to attach it even. I don't know if it's possible to put it in the chat, but I, I <laughs> that may be a bit good way to share with everyone. Um, not sure if it will though, if there's not a link, but yeah, that'd be awesome. Let me try. Uh, I have it like prepared <laughs> somewhere here. Um, okay. Well, he's working uh, on that. Um, Prakash, are you... Are you um, just about set? Have you got 
see if we can hear him now. And unfortunately, we still haven't heard from the Everest ER team. Um, it, it is, it, it's, it's difficult to get a good signal up there sometimes. And there was the, um, no, I cannot hear you yet, Prakash. Um, shoot. Um, Prakash, perhaps are you able to maybe zoom in on your phone? Maybe the microphone would pick up that way. Because it looked like you could share your screen earlier. We just couldn't hear you. All right. Any other questions while um, Dr. Carell is, is getting set up? Any other questions for Dr. Gamire or Karki or Padel? Can you hear me, Jesse? Now? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. <laughs> Okay, let me share my screen, okay? Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, good evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Prakas, and I was one of the volunteer doctor in Everest ER in 21 season. And currently, right now, I'm in Kathmandu uh, and working here. And so, let me begin my presentation. So, before I begin, let me show you all of you uh, basics of Everest ER, how, what, what was there when we went there. So, when we went there, you can see the, there is a Kumbu glacier over there. Uh, I must say that. Uh, everything in the base camp is temporary. Uh, whatever you set up in the base camp will be like taken off in the end of the season. So similarly, on the beginning, you need to have like it is all base camp, and in the ice, you need to uh, put some uh, make some places for the base camp to set up. So these wooden blocks, uh, you can see here, these are the base layer of the Everest ER clinic uh, in the Kumbu Glacier, and these are the Sherpas. You can see there, they are like. Uh, they are all preparing for our base camp, for our tent to get in. Uh, these are so heavy blocks and it will take at least one or two days for the clinic to set up. It's not easy. Uh, you need to have carry all these piles of wooden blocks from work safety here. And then setting up is quite a lengthy work and quite a challenging task as well. So you can see that lots of like at least five, six people are working to build the tent. So at the end of one or two days, uh, you can see the tent uh, being built up and, and then we start the training. Okay, so let us start with our first case. Uh, uh, my case is quite similar to Dr. Pawan's case. Uh, it's the case of a casualty uh, at an ice fall uh, in the crevasse. So it happened at the beginning of our season. So as Pawan already told that uh, lots of Sherpas do rotation up in the camp one, camp two to carry goods, like they carry oxygen cylinders, they carry food stuffs to camp one and camp two. And they do quite a lot of rotation from camp one to base camp and camp base camp to camp two. So this happened with the, one of the Sherpa, he was a young Sherpa. Uh, he was way down from the uh, to base camp from camp one after unloading all the oxygen and food tanks. So while they were coming down, uh, he fell, uh, as you know that glaciers move, they are you know, constantly moving uh, quite a bit every time. So there was a quite a, uh, there was quite a movement on the Kumbu glacier and uh, his, uh, the ladder got slipped and the, and the Sherpa fell in the crevasse. Like it was, he didn't feel much, he fell just three meters down in the crevasse. 
but the what and he was hanging on the fixed rope because all of you know that when the sherpas walk up to the camp one and when they come down they attach themselves to the fixed rope so they don't fail down to the crevasse so what happened with this guy is that he was quite unlucky uh, he fell into crevasse just three meters but unfortunate thing is that uh, uh, he uh, quite a small block of ice came from above and hit his leg you know uh, that was the cause of injury and here you can see that uh, this is a base camp all these yellow tents are the base camps and uh, this uh, red area over here this is the whole this this ice fall area and the, uh, this red area is the place where this casualty happened so there was a crevasse over here and the sherpa fell in this area uh, so it was early in the morning like quite 5 a.m in the morning when he was coming down from camp one to the base camp and after the ice block hit him uh, he was injured and his accompanying team members uh, he was not alone there were other team members with him and they took him out of the uh, crevasse and they could see that now uh, uh, the sherpas could see there is some showcase of blood in his summit suit and fortunately one of the sherpas uh, who were coming down with him was uh, trained in a first aid he was first aid trained so he put some uh, splints in his leg that was injured and and then he wrapped it around the sleeping mattress to protect him from hypothermia that's a quite a quite a lifesaver because he was trained in first aid before he went up there so so we were informed at 6 a.m in the morning uh since it was not possible him to carry him down from the ice fall to the base camp uh heli rescue was uh notified uh, notified and uh helicopter came at 8 a.m in the morning and uh, a long line rescue was attempted uh as we already saw in the Commons video that uh, Lakpa is the one who, who does all kinds of long rescue in the uh, base camp. So Lakpa did try to do the long line rescue up to go to the ice fall area, but unfortunately, two of the attempts of the two of the attempts were failed uh, because there are high wind up in the uh, up in the ice fall area. So two of the attempts were uh, could not be successful. And on the third attempt, uh, a long line rescue was abandoned, and a pilot planned to throw out a rope. To the patient and so that uh, the sherpas around there will wrap him in the tie him with a just rope and bring him down to the base camp so when the third attempt was made unfortunately this was quite a, he was unlucky in this case as well because uh, there was some kind of failure in the helicopter the the helicopter pilot listened some uh, unusual noises so he said that he could not fly the helicopter to the ice area because he thinks that helicopter is not working so that he landed in the helicopter again to the helipad in the base camp and then he started uh, talking to the engineers in the loop lab so that how, how he could repair the helicopter. And it was already 8 a.m. and the incident it was already three hours passed and he, uh, and the and the Serpa wounded so uh, wounded Serpa was waking up there and I told to get recovered. And so by the time the helicopter was uh, being repaired, uh, we were in constantly talking with the Serpas who were who were with the wounded Serpa and uh, uh, we were giving him advice that uh, he uh, and getting his vitals like how we are asking to check his pulse we are asking to do the compression bandage to the area we are asking to do not move the sherpas here and there and and luckily one of the sherpas who was training foster had some ibuprofen tablets with him as well so we asked him to give ibuprofen tablets to him put some compression bandage so that he can at least get a bit of pain relief from the uh, kind of trauma and so uh, at the 10 a.m. in the morning, uh, finally the helicopter was repaired, luckily, and uh, a helicopter went up to the uh, ice fall area and the Serpas there tied him with the rope and brought him down to the base camp. It was 10 a.m. So just five hours after the incident that he was brought down to the base camp. So he was, uh, incident happened at 5 a.m. in the morning and he was brought down to the helicopter at 10 a.m. So here's a small video. Uh, so if you listen carefully to the audio you can see that you can uh, listen to the strong wind that is going on around here so that you can so this lakpa longer just could not land in the area so okay you can listen to the strong wind there. so this is this is the 10 a.m in the morning you can see the here that patient was tied with the rope and he was directly brought from the ice fall area to the base camp So this looks quite scary for him, but he was just tied with the rope 
this patient is alive here and he was brought down to the base camp so on arrival at the helipad uh, we were all uh, we, we had all kinds of equipment with us on the helicopter we had our emergency kit here and we checked all of his things in his uh, in the helipad only we didn't try to bring him up to the, our clinic because there was quite a 10 minutes distance from the helipad to our uh, clinic so on at the helipad his uh, oxygen saturation was 85 percent pulse was 140 respiration he had no signs of respiratory distress his blood pressure was uh, 110 by 70. Uh, since he had injury in his uh, leg we checked his uh, dorsal spadis pulse and it was palpable and his tcs was okay uh, but uh, unfortunately his, there was survival tenderness was positive and uh, chest auscultation was normal uh, uh thing we can see was that he, he had some blood was quite visible on his right thigh and he complained of severe pain over there. So we just cut off his uh, summit suit and we can see that his skin was bleached and there was some blood over there. And so we made a provisional diagnosis of open femur fracture, even though we cannot see any bone, but his skin was, uh, uh, his skin was uh, uh, average. So we made a provisional diagnosis and we did a management over there. Uh, we opened the IV line. Well, we were two doctors over there working there. Uh, we did a neck extabulation with pillows on both sides. Unfortunately, we didn't have any neck collars over there. And then we gave him some pain management with morphine and uh, you know, some anti antimetics like one and and ceftriaxone. And we did uh, emo, emo, uh, we opened up the sticks that was bind from uh, up in the uh, up in the ice pool area because uh, we had to check his wounds. So that's why we uh, we removed the initial uh, sticks that were kept by the Sherpas and we. Uh, after the all examination, we kept him in a double. We kept a double sand screen, and then after we uh, we did some, uh, we wrapped him in a sleeping bag to prevent him from hypothermia. And we then planned him to evacuate to Kathmandu. And this management part took around 15 to 20 minutes for us. So that's why uh, we did a re, re, re evaluation of the case. Uh, on the re evaluation, we noticed that his pulse was feeble. Uh, so that was not as that was not as, as it was in the beginning so we connected iv normal saline as well and then after uh since there was all all since there was no as power set there will be no any paramedics in the uh, helicopter and since there were all also cervical tenderness and pulse was feeble uh i decided myself to go with him to the Kathmandu because it will take around 45 minutes to one hour for him to reach from Kathmandu to uh, sorry base camp to uh, so there might be any kind of incident on the midway on the helicopter so that's why uh, I and the team decided to accompany him to the Kathmandu. And on helicopter, uh, he complained of nausea. And so that's why I gave him uh, online set on the midway from the helicopter on the way. So on the, uh, on the in the Kathmandu, he was received by the ER team and, uh, and all the basic stops were done by the ER team. And then he was taken to CT scan. On the CT scan, you can see that there was a kind of femur fracture, the two pieces of femur over there. and 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 then after he was taken to surgery ward and then surgery was done on the same day uh he was the open reduction and fixation was done on the same day and he did well after okay so this was the case uh quite interesting case because like it took around five years for him to evacuate and the lessons that we can learn uh, we learned good lessons from here is that uh guys whoever goes up in high mountains should be given a proper first aid course to them despite it's really lifesaver so in this case, as you can see that uh, he was injured at 5 a.m. in the morning and he was brought down just in the 10 a.m. in the, you know, it took around five hours for him from, to rescue him from the uh, ice ball area to the base camp. So if there had not been any uh, first aid trainer, up, if, if the guide was not trained, it, 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 he won't be alive right now because uh, since the guide was trained there, he put some screen there and he gave some pain medications and he also wrapped him up a sleeping mat so that uh, maximally protect him from hypothermia and a bleeding as well. And the second thing we learned is that uh, we need to prepare for the worst. You know, uh, there is always chance that there can be fault uh, in the helicopter as well, as we saw in this case. And there were two failed attempts due to bad weather. So I always prepare for the worst. And other things that we learned from this case is that uh, we need to always prepare for the mass facility when we walk in the wilderness. Uh, as, the, uh, as many of us know that in 2014, there was an ice fall uh, a tragedy. Uh, because uh, uh, there was avalanche in the ice fall area and 14 of the Sherpas were dead over there. Uh, fortunately, in this case, there was just one casualty. So if there had been two or three Sherpas who fell in the Sherpas, uh, that would be quite difficult for the, all the doctors in the, who were available in the uh, base camp to manage all those three, four or five cases. Fortunately, there was just one Sherpa who fell in the Sherpas, so that was quite 
uh, not stressful for us to manage. If there had been like more than three or four cases, uh, four or five uh, sepas in the Kribas, that will be quite hard for us to manage all those cases there. So that was the learning lessons from this case. Okay. So yeah, that was the case. <laughs> Any yeah, questions? great. Great case. Yeah. I, I did have a question. When you said the pulse was feeble, was it in yeah. the injured extremity or were, was it in his other extremities as well? Well, the pulse was feeble on his radial pulse. Right? And we didn't check again the uh, digital pulse. We checked his radial pulse after 15 to 20 minutes after we did the primary management. So it was quite feeble. And uh, and since the, and his, there was neck tenderness as well. And so that's why I decided to accompany him to the Kathmandu. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but you guys don't keep any blood products at Everest ER, do you? Not really. Um, no, no. We yeah, I, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> no, think no. so. Wow. Yeah. Can, that's an awesome case. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any questions? Yeah, yeah I would like to uh, ask a question. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure if uh, there's a solid answer to that. Uh, use of morphine or any other opiates like codeine, uh, in my experience, uh, there's, uh, there's been drop in oxygen saturation because these are uh, respiratory de depressants, right? So um, yeah. how, how safe are, you know, like respiratory depressants at high altitude uh, uh, when using cough syrups or, or, or medications that cause respiratory depression? Uh, well, in my experience, uh, people have shown to uh, with their, their oxygen saturation drops by a few notches. And uh, yeah, so that's my question. How safe are opiates uh, at high altitude? Yeah, yeah, you are right. Uh, you are the asking that question. So we had like two options for the pain medication. Like we had ketamine and we had diclofenac and we had morphine. So this guy was in terrible pain and uh, we were sure that he needs to get evacuated in like less than one hour. So we uh, and so we thought that uh, it's okay to give morphine because anyway he's going down. So that's why we opted for morphine. So if if you are plan if if you have stay there for in the base camp only we will have planned to give him diplo or vitamin and then, so since he was going down so we gave him morphine at the time. Okay, that's um, what I think. Herman Brugger um, has a maybe has a question for you as well, Dr. Caro. Yeah, sure. Good, good point, of you. Yeah. It's, Thank you. Uh, great presentation and great case. Very. I think he got uh, the best management possible. I have one question from camp one to base camp. How did you transport the patient? Um, you haven't uh, a stretcher, I suppose. So how did you get them down over the glacier? Oh, uh so in, in the long run rescue, if, if, it, if there had been a long run rescue, so long run rescue takes a, a ice sledge with him. So he binds with him in an ice sledge, the, what we use for the skiing actually. So in this case, a long run rescue was not done and the guide over there didn't have any kind of uh, sledge with him with them. So that's why they just bind him with ropes in a sleeping mattress. And he was bound in a rope and they tied him with a helicopter and they brought him down as i saw so saw you in the video so they just tied with the rope only in the sleeping mattress so that's why they brought him down in this case yeah otherwise uh so, and it was uh and other and since uh so on the meantime uh, when the helicopter was not made we were also planning someone to carry him down actually because we were not sure if the helicopter was will be repaired or not uh because it was already five hours and we were planning that someone will go there and carry it there but it will take around like we thought that it would take around eight to ten hours to bring him down from up from the, the ice pole area to the camp farm. So we decided to just wait for the helicopter to be repaired. Okay, thank you. Prakash, I, I guess none of us have heard from Sanjeev um, or Samrita yeah. yet, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not a big surprise. Um, it's, it's hard to get good Wi-Fi up at Everest Base Camp. <laughs> um, so I was, I was trying wondering... to make a call. Yeah, I was trying to make a call and they didn't receive, no? <laughs> okay, okay. Well, that's that's all right. It's good. We thought this, you know, could be a problem. So um, would you like to show the video that you made 
um, that you made last year for the folks. It's a very short video. It um, shows a little bit about FSDR, just in case um, Dr. Bandari and Dr. Pant can't um, get to us. So right now, I must say that this weather is not good over here. It's raining in Kathmandu, and there, is, there must be snowfall in Everest Base Camp right now. So that's why I think they are not able to connect to us right now. So. Uh, so Jesse, I have the video that somebody just sent to me in the afternoon. Uh, so that will be a new video. And um, will it be okay if I share the somebody just video that he said in the morning? Me. So Jesse, I have the video from the somebody just so today that he sent it to me today for if so he asked that if he could not attend, please show this video from uh, from their side. A video from the base camp today. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I had a little bit of trouble hearing you. You cut out for yeah. a second. Sorry. Yeah. So, yes, somebody just sent a video from the base camp today, today afternoon. Is it okay if I saw that video? Oh, you, you still have the video from last year? No, this year, this year. Oh, this year you have one. Okay, yeah. okay, that's yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Okay. Great, great. Right. Uh -huh. So can you see the, uh, the screen? Yeah, we can. I can see it. Okay, let me start the video. So somebody, the one of the doctor in Everest here, sent me this video in the afternoon to share with all of you people here. And um, for those of you that have worked there before, feel free to narrate and um, kind of tell what we're seeing if you want. Yeah, I can I can help a little. Um, if you can just go back a little, I can just uh, start from the the door winter. So uh, basically, it's a big uh, I think weather report tent uh, um, that is uh, probably the biggest tent in the base camp. Uh, it has two compartments. Uh, the The base is pretty impressive. It's it is uh, pretty flat as compared to the rest of the tent, and takes a lot of effort to get it together. Uh, it has pretty um, big uh, wooden com pieces that needs to be put together to create that flat area. Uh, so uh, I think it has nine um, blocks, and each of them like weigh around 40 pounds and that has to be carried from Goraksha to the base camp every year um, and back uh, so uh, that's uh, the probably the heaviest part and then this uh, uh, iron uh, support uh, the the framework uh, all of these has to be taken down and they were pretty heavy as well um, so uh, pretty big structure uh, um, and I think it is the biggest tent and probably the coldest tent as well, because it didn't have any inner lighting. So that was one of our complaints when we were there. Maybe they can just add some. Um, uh, I was hoping they could have that inner lining uh, that would happen help. So it has two comp compartments. Uh, the uh, like after we entered, we saw that there was like a curtain before we entered the, the main clinic. So we used to um, keep that compartment as a waiting room uh, when we worked there. I think that's the same this uh, this year as well. So. Uh, the patients so who so we that way we could give some privacy to people as much as we can um, um so we could have uh, the people who are waiting uh, outside the, the outer compartment and then uh people who um, um were getting treated or, or came for the to be seen in the inner compartment we had three um um beds there um the, all of them were folding beds um, um and uh also um, a communication desk. So we had a radio communication instrument there and we were able to communicate with all the teams in the base camp. So they have uh, one frequency that was just for average ER and uh, um, people used to communicate us on that. Sometimes we used to hear this uh, random calls from um, um, from the people who are up, uh, up in the higher camps trying to ask for any suggestion. Um, um, like for, for medication, they used to have medication sometimes and they used to just uh, ask us regarding dose and everything. So that was pretty helpful. Um, um, so that was one of the effective way to communicate. I think that's the same this year as well. Uh, pretty basic equipment. And I think you can play and I'll just try to add up as, as I as I find something interesting. Otherwise, you can just have a look. Yeah. Yeah. So this one, this, the, this tent is a new one. Uh, there was a small tent in 2015. Uh, so that was damaged due to earthquake. 
and in 2016 a new tent was brought which is this one and this is quite bigger than the that one before 2015. Can you tell us kind of what diagnostics you have available? What what um, what sort of capabilities you have there? Uh, I think it, it varies every year. Uh, so one um, interesting thing that happened with me when I was there was uh, the, the EKT. Um, so the, the EKT at that time uh, had a, um, a, a portable device that uh, had a definitive search uh, software that went with the laptop that came with EKG. And sadly that laptop was lost when being transported. So um, I was able to get that software downloaded to uh, Dr. Dunarian's uh, laptop and I and, and then install it there. Um, and somehow it, it was, we were able to make it work. We, were need, we didn't really think that we'd use it. Uh, um, most of the things were mostly clinical and really not hoping to get an MI um, there in the base camp, but um, just opposed to our expectation, we did have an MI uh, that came in. Uh, and uh, because of that EKG, we were able to diagnose it, um, treat it with whatever measures we had, uh, keep him overnight in the Everest GI tent. And then he flew to a different facility only after 10 hours or 12 hours of presentation. Um, so pretty limited. And the next, uh, the other year, uh, we had this uh, um, uh, monitor with defibrillator uh, that was donated, uh, not donated, but lent uh, through um, Mountain Medicine Society. Um, and uh, this was uh, available at the base camp. I think this was when Prakash was there. So that's a pretty useful tool as well. Uh, we have a lot of um, um, oxygen saturation uh, measuring device and half of them don't work. <laughs> uh, Stat. Um, and uh, I think uh, we have two pretty impressive gamma bags. Uh, the, these are pressure bags that we can use to um, uh, get people down if they have NMS and we don't have enough oxygen. Uh, generally, we have pretty good supply of oxygen at base camp and all the teams, um, they have their own portable oxygen cylinder, so we can even use that. Uh, but uh, those gamma bags are pretty impressive as well, just in case uh, um, if anyone um, has AMS and there is some delayed transportation, we can have them that and we can get them down 1000 uh, meters uh, in just five to 10 minutes, five, uh, minutes. And then, um, yeah, it's very impressive. Other than that, um, I, I do not recall much, much, uh, much of an increment is mostly it's clinical. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the problem at the base camp is the power source actually. So this machine, this uh, ECG machine used a lot of power. So when there's like battery starts to come down, you cannot use it. The problem is always the power backup over there. So when there is no sunshine, the battery cannot be charged due to solar power and then you cannot run the machine. And uh, I, I forgot to say about a very good, uh, important piece of equipment that uh, that's uh, donated uh, through Sonosite every year. Uh, and somebody has to uh, carry it from US to Nepal and then carry back from Nepal to US every year. There's this uh, equipment that they donate uh, every season. Uh, it's a Sonosite uh, uh, ultrasound machine and that's pretty helpful as well. Um, so uh, that's one of the other equipment that I forgot to mention. Awesome. So you, so you guys are awesome at your physical exams. That's one thing I noticed in the couple of times that I've been up in the Kumbu is the doctors up there do a physical exam like no one I see in the States. And I think it's really important for the medical students listening and the residents, you know, if you're interested in wilderness medicine, you want to be really, really good at doing a great physical exam because that may be the only diagnostic you have available. Yeah. So all the diagnosis tool we have is the urine pregnancy test over there and uh, uh, urine deep stick test. That's the other two only tests we have there. I think the, somebody was trying to say something about those uh, red boxes there. So um, they have, uh, I, I, I was not there uh, during the earthquake season, but uh, these boxes, uh, I think they, they played a very important role at that time. Because uh, every year we just keep these uh, medication in these three boxes that are kind of um, um, 
compartment uh, like wise and then we just separate them as per system so gi block and then there is like respiratory symptom wise and then uh, so patient system and there are three blocks so uh, during earthquake so everything blew apart um, um, that's what i was told i was not there but uh, lakpa told me that everything blew apart uh, the tent was shattered uh, everything was covered in um, the snow that came down from Mori and then um, uh, to when the initial at the initial stage when people were trying to just organize things, uh, people were looking for these red boxes because everybody knew that there is like major portion of the medication there, and it was quite uh, preserved because those were pretty portable and pretty uh, durable boxes and uh, people were looking for those red boxes from the snow and then were able to get them out were able to get uh, some the medical some of the medications from there and that was well preserved. So uh, <clears throat> that have, that the, those boxes are still there and have quite a history. <laughs> it looks cold. Hmm. And um, just wanted to add uh, that's interesting thing about uh, the base camp uh, cooks. They are pretty impressive. Uh, the the, the limited things they have, uh, but the amount of uh, different things they could make in the base camp was pretty impressive. From uh, lasagna to to cake and everything, whatnot in the base camp, you know, uh, it's pretty impressive. I was really impressed by the um, the skills of the the cooks in the base camp. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, luckily for the base camp, the, most of the things uh, comes all the way from Kathmandu, uh, so that was one of the benefit of being there because we have helicopter flights every day mostly for rescue and they always bring something um, for uh, some teams and there are also commercial flights going on for the um, getting things uh, but the amount of uh, food um, and different variety they could make was pretty impressive <laughs> awesome well would we like to maybe make one more round of cases while we've got time and then we can kind of open up the floor for questions looks like um herman raised his hand again did you have a quick question before we go on to the next case uh one one short question uh have you the equipment to intubate a patient at the base camp and manually ventilate a patient during a flight to Kathmandu? in just in case you have have a the possibility uh, of a flight to Kathmandu, Kathmandu with a patient? Um, we do have uh, e equipment that are necessary for intubation. So um, um, the tubes, uh, the bag and mask ventilation, uh, everything is there. Uh, so the hardest part of that uh, is just trying to make that decision to intubate someone uh, at the base camp. Uh, we even uh, kind of uh, joked about it with my partner, uh, Dinesh, who traveled uh, to Kathmandu for the patient, uh, we just had this small uh, separate bag for intubation set, a bag and mask and everything. And we said that uh, that's the that's the thing that we don't want to touch this season. Just let's have it in some corner ready, but let's not try to use that. And uh, so we um, thought about uh, intubating that uh, patient who did have head injury um, and was going to transfer to the Kathmandu, but like I said, uh, we did not know how, what the travel would be like. Um, with just one doctor in the back of a helicopter uh, trying to do all the things. Um, and um, as long as we could avoid it, we tried to avoid it. Um, um, <clears throat> the time I used a bag and mask ventilation um, uh, in the base camp was in the same season. Um, so at the end of the season, I had this another patient that came in um, uh, in a helicopter and was uh, already unconscious, didn't have pulse uh, when I uh, jumped into the helicopter um, and had to be made a quick decision whether we want to go to Kathmandu or just uh, do something about it. I, I thought that yeah, as he's pulseless, I think the, the wisest thing to do is just stop in the base camp helicopter and do what we can because the next stop would be look like that is around 14 minutes away. So, uh, at that point, I had this bag with the uh, air equipment and, uh, and and epinephrine and everything. So we did one round of uh, epi and did a CPR, and I used that uh, bag and mask ventilation. Um, he he was already uh, down for at least half an hour, so we didn't go very aggressive with the CPR because uh, uh, that would 
probably not be um, very useful at that point. But yeah, we did use the bag and mask at that time um, in that condition. Yeah, okay. I was thinking about, thinking about that because if you have a defibrillator, so uh, could be useful also to intubate the patient just in case you have to defibrillate and uh, you're successful and uh, you have a return of spontaneous circulation, then uh, probably you need to uh, ventilate the patient for a certain time. And if the flight is 30 minutes, 40 minutes, um, it's hard to do the bag valve mask ventilation during half, uh, half an hour. So therefore, um, maybe it could be useful also to intubate a patient with uh, endotracheal intubation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Abiyu has volunteered to, um, to, to go next with another case if, if he's ready. And um, he, had, he had messaged me when we were first starting the program. He said, I'm actually taking care of a hate patient right now. Um, <laughs> and so he's, he's actually got a, got a hate patient in his clinic. And um, he, might, he might just tell us a little bit about it if he wants to, and then hear from his next case. Uh Okay, namaste again, and uh, uh, welcome to the presentation, Dr. Bruger. Uh, yeah, so we have a hay patient here who uh, well, seems to be stable now. Uh, we also had a hay patient yesterday uh, who was showing a saturation of one and two, and he was unconscious, and then uh, he spewed up a lot of blood. Uh, but thankfully, he made it through the night, and uh, we see almost seven to ten hay patients a week. <laughs> so it's, it's not something new. Uh, but but the one right now is is pretty much stable. Uh, he also had some um, PVCs um, on ECG, so uh, might be induced by HIP or hypoxia. Who knows, right? So uh, anyway, right now he's doing well. Uh, so yeah, maybe uh, uh, we can do the other presentation. It's all right with everyone. Yeah. Uh, all right, so oh, let me see where it is. All right, are we, uh, is everyone able to see the presentation? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, so uh, just a second. All right, so this is my uh, second presentation. Yeah. All right. So yeah, this is my second presentation uh, titled "Dogs of Kumbu: Fangs and Claws of COVID." Uh, yeah. So probably you guys are already sick and tired of uh, hearing this uh, dirty word COVID uh, time and again. But uh, I promise this presentation won't have uh, too much of uh, uh, too much of COVID profanity. All right. So. Uh, over, over 10,000 years ago, uh, Tibetan Mastiffs were first uh, domesticated by early humans on the Tibetan Plateau, uh, interbreeding with the Himalayan Grey Wolf. Uh, this gave them the ability to adapt to high altitude living. Uh, when a team did the first uh, traverse of the Great Himalayan Trail uh, in, in 2017, uh, Mastiff named uh, Setuk uh, joined the group, even, even climbing over the Tashilapcha Pass. Uh, which is uh, 5,700 meters high. Uh, and then this is a pretty tough pass. Um, once Setuk even accompanied uh, mountaineers of the Kumbu Icefall to Camp 2. So uh, some of these dogs make uh, better climbers than some of us humans. Uh, another Tibetan Mastiff named uh, Tashi uh, once walked back from a village in Ramichap to Kathmandu following his uh, Japanese owner. Uh, dogs often follow trekkers in Nepal. They bond with them, acting as guides and camp watchdogs uh, in return for food and adventure. Uh, some of these dogs stay on uh, in the mountains and are feral hunting in packs, uh, much like their evolutionary ancestors. Uh, while dogs have been known to attack yaks in high pastures in uh, Kumbu. Okay, so. Well, Himalayan dogs are known to be huge and majestic, uh, adding to the charm of the villages in Kumbu. Uh, although quite intimidating at uh, first glance, uh, the dogs are pretty much harmless. 
the stark difference between uh, you know stray dogs and uh, domesticated dogs seen anywhere else um, is, is not seen seen here in Kumbu as uh, stray dogs here exhibit a kind of uh, gentlemanliness, a, a kind of domestication towards uh, the villages they belong to. Uh, it is it is as if the dog didn't belong to a particular owner, uh, but the village as a whole. Um, as an example, the picture taken above uh, was of a stray dog from Dingoche that uh, escorted us uh, on a short hike up Nangarsang Peak. Uh, these dogs seldom quarrel amongst themselves, uh, as there is nothing to quarrel over uh, when when resources are plentiful. Uh, however, they are highly protective of the village's uh, pride and uh, do not hesitate to attack outsiders. Uh, as an example here, uh, this particular tourist dog was uh, attacked by uh, local dogs at Namche Bazar. Uh, as, the, as the dog wouldn't let me suture the lacerations, uh, uh, the wounds were cleaned and, and repaired using staples. You're a vet too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> People of Kumbu rely heavily on trekkers and tourists uh, as the main source of income. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, influx of uh, in influx to Kumbu dropped drastically. Uh, this caused an economic crisis for the inhabitants and uh, a food crisis for the dogs. Uh, dogs that used to be well fed and, and thus docile, uh, driven by starvation, started uh, showing some violent tendencies. Uh, much like wolves, they started forming packs. Uh, dogs that were once uh, civilized, uh, triggered by hunger, now fell back to their primitive instincts. Uh, dogs would form gangs and, and there would be uh, territorial war between gangs. Uh, they would attack each other and, and, and wouldn't hesitate to eat their own. Uh, the, the footage on the left was uh, taken from our clinic window uh, in Namche Bazar. Uh, dogs can be seen fighting uh, each other with uh, with much uh, vigor. Uh, towards the end of last year, that is 2020, uh, dog bite cases rose exponentially. Uh, these were not casual bites and scratches from a disgruntled dog. Uh, these were like morbid uh, dog attacks with a uh, sole intention to kill and uh, eat its prey. Uh, it became dangerous for people to walk alone. Uh, out of many of the attacks on locals, uh, a child was attacked by a group of dogs in Pangboche uh, and had deep life-threatening injuries on her back, uh, as you can see in the picture here. Uh, she was uh, lucky as, as neighbors were able to chase the dogs away um, in the nick of time. Uh, in this footage, we can see a domesticated uh, Himalayan dog, uh, or, or a puppy actually, uh, although it looks pretty huge. Uh, it's a puppy. Uh, uh, he's towing around with this uh, yak calf um, uh, in his, in his full-grown stage. Uh, the dog would protect the cattle from wild threats like foxes, wolves, and uh, snow leopards. Uh, recently, the pup was sadly killed and eaten, not, not by a snow leopard, but by other feral dogs. Uh, there have been other instances of dog-eat-dog, -dog, something uh, the locals here had never seen before. Uh, Kumbus, uh, Langur monkeys, uh, which were wary only of snow leopards and wolves, uh, are now being attacked and uh, eaten by dogs. Uh, in, in Dingboche, this unfortunate monkey met, uh, met, a, met such a fate and, and was left half eaten by dogs. Uh, as the dogs, uh, dog attacks started increasing both in frequency and severity, uh, we started receiving requests to make avail some, some poison to kill these uh, rampant beasts. Uh, this was obviously denied as it is against what doctors believe in and, and practice, uh, you know, as per the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, what was remarkable was that in a place like Kumbu, where Buddhism is, is deeply embedded in the culture and people are strongly against killing or harming animals, uh, requests to poison a dog uh, came off uh, as a strong evidence that the situation was getting awfully out of hand. Uh, the situation now is, is much improved uh, now that the pandemic, pandemic is uh, tapering off. 
things are getting back to normal. There's some movement of people. Uh, dogs get to eat, uh, and in turn, dog attacks are going down noticeably. Uh, this behavioral change in, in, in Kumbu's dogs uh, could be studied in more detail. Uh, but what we witnessed firsthand was uh, thousands of years of, you know, like domestication fading away in a matter of months uh, as a result of starvation. Uh, an interesting uh, side effect of the whole uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so yeah, that's that's about it. This is a short and uh, uh, probably not so scientific <laughs> paper, uh, uh, but I mean, I, I found it interesting. So I thought you guys would too. All right, thank you. That was thank you, Abby. That was really <laughs> interesting. Those from from my experience, the dogs were always so friendly there. That was like one of my favorite things was meeting all these nice dogs as we trekked up. And that's pretty crazy that they turned on everyone so quick. Um, did you treat a lot of dog bites yourself? Um, uh, not many, uh, maybe less than five. Uh, but dog bites usually led to dog death. <laughs> right, and, right. And, and, and yeah, so, but now it is pretty, pretty calm and uh, it is not as uh, violent as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, so things are getting back to normal. Yeah. How are volumes? Are is the number of trekkers coming through? Is it um, more more on par with previous years? Is it still down? Is it how, how are the volumes coming through? Okay. Previously, it used to be around two thousand uh, tourists or trekkers coming into Namche every day, and then these are uh, stats from the check post Namche check post. Uh, nowadays, we see 200, 300. So. Um, one day there was some 600 something, uh, you know, like visitors. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, nowhere close to what it used to be. Thank you so much. Um, any any questions um, for Dr. Gamire before we move on to another case? Is anyone making an effort to warn the truckers? Maybe the dogs aren't as friendly as they were in past years. Uh, Make less work for you. <laughs> uh, we we just had a dog bite case a uh, few days ago, and it was a uh, it was by a pup. Yeah, it was a small pup that uh, bit the man, and uh, uh, but but the kind of you know like violent, uh, morbid kind of attacks uh, those are not taking place nowadays. Uh, I haven't seen one in in almost a year now. So I think uh, I I think we should uh, let tourists come and 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 you know like feed these uh, dogs with some biscuits and stuff so that they don't go primitive again. <laughs> yeah, I think. Do, uh, do you have rabies um, immunoglobulin or, or vaccines available at the clinic? Uh, we have inactivated uh, Varicel vaccine, uh, 2.5 IU. Um, it, it comes in five doses. So 0, 3, 7, 14, and 28. And, and some individuals are, are really scared and they, they want to take the 60th day dose also. So some people take six doses, um, but the standard dosing is, is five, five doses, 0, 3, 7, 14, and 28. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Dr. Karki, would you, would you like to present another one of your cases and then probably have a, enough time for another case from Dr. Carell and Sadly, we haven't gotten to hear from our folks at base camp. That's just one of the side effects of being at the highest ER in the world, I guess. <laughs> I was able to barely get some message from Sanjeev. Uh, he says that there's been some technical issues with the internet today. Uh, so, and I asked him if, it was, if he would be able to join. And uh, he said that it's, it's pretty, um, Patchy <laughs> with the net, so that's uh, finger crossed. Um, yeah, yeah. I would. Uh, I was hoping to to see more altitude related cases, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but, um, I think uh, um, this was a uh, some some um, eye conditions uh, uh, that uh, I saw during my stay in the base camp ER. Uh, because uh, um, with high altitude uh, medicine, we uh, see a lot of uh, ultra, uh, um, AMS um, and uh, also haze and hape. Uh, but 
I didn't prepare myself for as many eye conditions when I went to the base camp ER, uh, but I did have quite a few and it was um, very significant because uh, it costed uh, two of the um, climbers and um, my friends there to abandon their um, expedition. So I think uh, it's something that we don't talk as much, but I think it's it's seen very often. Um, some kind of eye symptoms when they go higher in the altitude um, in the hypoxic environment. So this is Dr. D. Um, um, she's a very um, uh, very lovely uh, doctor from. Uh, she's Irish, works in Australia, and now she's in Antarctica uh, right now. As we talk, uh, there she's in there for six months. Uh, she is pretty impressive. I learned so much from her. She is um, great um, um, talking to the patients and very uh, humble. And uh, shout out to Dr. D. <laughs> so she's trying to examine one of the patients, uh, just trying to create some dark environment to have uh, that pupil dilate a little so she can um, have a look on that fundus. So um, um, this was a case of a 34 year old. Uh, Climber, who was in fact a EM physician, he was from Canada um, and uh, was there for um, expedition, uh, not as a doctor but as a uh, climber. Um, um, he <clears throat> um, was also a friend of mine, uh, so I I had all of, uh, I followed his whole journey uh, during that season. He did have a pretty relaxed uh, um, and well acclimatized hike to the base camp. <clears throat> he uh, climbed another peak um, that was about 6,000 uh, and did not really have much symptoms until he made his first uh, acclimatization hike. Uh, so the first acclimatization hike would be around uh, 6,500 meters uh, to the camp too. And uh, he went to the uh, acclimatization hike and stayed there for a night uh, or two and then came down to the base camp. And then he was complaining of these eye symptoms. So Those were uh, small areas that were kind of scotomas or defects in his visual field that was kind of flashing or, or pulsating. Um, so we were just all left with scratching our heads. Like we did not know what exactly was going on with him. Um, um, so D try to do a phonoscopic exam. So we sometimes see, um, it's very common to see high altitude retinal hemorrhages when you go to the high altitude. Um, so that was our expectations, um, uh, but didn't really see anyone present with a scotoma with retinal hemorrhages. They are pretty benign. People may climb, just come down and never have a symptom. Um, our our initial suspicion was that was it a scotoma that involved like there was it a hemorrhage that is it maybe involved the macula, um, so we tried to look at his macula. Um, we didn't really get uh, D didn't really get a great view, but um, so C did see a small retinal hemorrhage that was like five o'clock uh, uh, in the disc. Uh, so uh, uh, he did uh, continue his uh, stay there. Um, and went for another hike uh, that was higher than that. So this time he went to 7,500 meters uh, to the camp three and then came down and had worsening um, scotoma. So these areas were now getting bigger. So at that point, um, it was, it was a decision he had to make whether he wants to continue. And we um, talked to some of our uh, physicians that were, um, were, that we were always in touch with. Um, and they suggested that I think it's the best time to just get back to the catman to get evaluated because we don't want him to lose his vision at 8,000 meter where there's nothing we can do. Uh, so he did come to Kathmandu and uh, interestingly, there was no significant finding. Um, he went back to Canada, did a full um, MRI and everything done um, and did not really have any, any findings in his uh, um, amazing whatsoever. Um, our initial suspicion was that he might have uh, something like a ocular, um, ocular migraine or uh, occipital uh, migraine that was causing the symptoms because he did have a uh, distant history of migraine and uh, occasional flaring up. Uh, so our initial suspicion was that maybe that was the case. So we even suggested trying to take um, nifedipine uh, if that would help, but um, they were not sure. So he, we, we did not uh, go 
with that treatment. That was our last reset, maybe try to treat it. But um, I think that was still something that we um, are not very sure of, but that is one of the different show um, could be a occipital migraine. Uh, this is another gentleman um, who's again a physician. And so if you're a physician, if you're going to altitude, take care of your eyes perhaps, <laughs> because he also had eye symptoms. Um, so he also did like his acclimatization high, didn't really have any problem, did his second uh, hike um, to 7,500 meters and didn't have any really problems. And then just before he was going to make a submit course, he started having these black spots in his right eye um, that is more in the up and now it's kind of moving. Um, but there was no uh, loss in acuity, he was able to read and everything. Um, but he came in the thing that there's a spot that keeps moving. Mm, so it's a floater. Um, so with the limited um, equipment that we have, uh, we try to do an ocular uh, ultrasound. Uh, and we thought we definitely saw something. Uh, <clears throat> so in the in the fundoscope exam, there was some um, um, that he did, he didn't have any hemorrhages. Um, oh, we could not see one because we couldn't see all the um, retina. But uh, the the area where we saw did not have hemorrhage. Um, I I certainly thought that day I did saw something in his features when we did ocular ocular ultrasound um, and. Just to confirm us, we did send it to another physician um, who was working in the uh, ferry chase without, without telling him and said that, okay, have this look at this ultrasound, just tell what you think. And he also had a suspicion that he could have the literal hemorrhage. So we um, asked him to get back to the catchment to, um, again, uh, there was his uh, uh, ophthalmic examination was not in connection with what we saw. He did have hemorrhages. Uh, uh, probably he we didn't look to the whole area. They could maybe dilate his eye better in the catman when he did have retinal hemorrhage, and that's um, that's not very uncommon. Um, but he did not have any vitreous hemorrhage. And so again, uh, was it a vitreous hemorrhage? Uh, was it not? Uh, his symptoms and the finding that we saw in the ultrasound did point towards that, but it was not never confirmed. Um, but he also had to uh, abandon his uh, expedition uh, because of. Uh, his eye symptoms. So let's talk a little bit more about some frostbite. Uh, um, so uh, during the whole RSTR, um, we didn't see much frostbite until uh, people start start going higher up, and then uh, they come back with uh, rashes and and uh, this uh, discoloration. They um, so this gentleman was from Ukraine. Um, came down from CAN3 after his second rotation. Uh, he said that he just merely took out his glove to change the, the battery torch um, uh, of his torch. And um, this, uh, he said it was a minute, but I think it's probably more than a minute given what injuries he had. So he did have this uh, blister discoloration of his tape. Initially, just some, uh, some um, blister, uh, one or two that were non-hemorrhagic, so probably grade two or three-ish. Uh, uh, but uh, I asked him to listen down. So what, what we do in the base camp for most of the frostbite is we, uh, most of the time when they come to us, they're already rewarmed. Uh, um, we rarely uh, see anyone with the frozen fingers coming down. So most of the time they have already rewarmed it themselves. Um, and uh, we try to decrease like risk of getting it um, frozen again. So the first thing is is to make sure that they don't go up. Um, and even if they do, they make sure that it doesn't have any chance of frozen. So that was the thing we told him. Um, we dressed it with some, uh, gave him some ibuprofen, um, uh, which uh, which helps with both pain and getting some of the uh, mediators. Um, um, prostaglandins and thromboxin down, uh, and then uh, asked him to go down to at least Lukla uh, so he can have better healing, but he did not go all the way down to Lukla. I think he went to half the way um, and thought that he was doing better and came back. So he, this was his same, um, same um, frostbite after a week. Uh, so it was not as bad when he came in, but was much worse. And uh, uh, my initial um, um, advice was always like, I think I think it's time to um, just cut down to Kathmandu and just try to save your fingers as much as you can. 
Um, another case, he had uh, already climbed Everest uh, um, when he came uh, down to me um, and he probably cost him some, or if not one or two toes. Um, I did not know what, what happened exactly because I didn't, I couldn't follow him up, but that definitely looks hemorrhagic to me. Um, and the, the second toe on the right side, uh, left side, it's probably as much more than grade three. Uh, he did feel some numbness um, from um, camp three, uh, did not uh, took his uh, boot until he returned all the way to camp three again. So that was probably 24 hours. Um, so he had some numbness, kept going. And then this was the thing that he saw when he took his boat off. So um, pretty impressive. Uh, sad for the patient but i um so uh, for so for something like that uh, we would uh recommend uh, an emergency evacuation um that um that would be for for iloprost uh, so we do have some iloprost um, um not in the base camp but uh, some centers in the Kathmandu that uh, do iloprost injections and that do have some benefit um, there are some um, climbers who carry um, heparin injections, enoxaparin injections, and uh, there was a, uh, some discussion whether we should use it or there's not. There have to be. They have. They have. No, there have been some uh, papers who show that there's some benefit. At the same time, um, uh, it is. It has to be in the early early stage, but we always thought about the risk of having someone in heparin uh, falling and then having some trauma. So didn't really recommend that, but I think it's, it's it could go either way. But I think iloprost is def definitely um, something that could have worked or, or have shown e efficacy and that we have sent a couple of people um, for that to the Kathmandu. Um, this gentleman from Singapore just wanted a nice picture um, from the summit, took his cap off for a minute and then when he came down to base camp, this happened. Um, so it is, so I think it's, when you're talking about um, the cold um, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the base camp, it's totally different than the cold we talk here because no, it's not just the cold induced like uh, vasoconstriction, we're talking about hypoxia and, and definitely much more when we going to all the way to summit. So I think that's why people get frostbite so easily when they're, um, up there, and uh, this was another case. Uh, uh, was uh, he already had uh, climbed Lot C when he came down? He was planning to climb uh, Everest in the same season, but had to cancel because of this. Um, so we, uh, for him, we did a, a series of uh, uh, dressing and for changes for him. We generally use uh, aloe vera. Um, I did not find much, I know, um, I mean, it, it does show some benefit, but nothing very substantial, but definitely no harm. Uh, so we do um, use it uh, for the dressing in the base camp. Um, and um, yeah, so pretty, I'm sorry if this is pretty nasty for some people, <laughs> but I think it's uh, uh, something that you have to expect when you're going to base camp. Um, um, you'll come across these kind of blisters. So another thing that I wanted to just, um, talk about is just this uh, picture, people standing to go to the summit uh, after two hours in that hypoxic environment. And this was a picture taken by Nim Spurja. I don't know how, uh, how, how, much, how many of you have seen his like, series in Netflix, uh, 14 pics. Uh, yeah. This was a picture he took that season in the Everest uh, in 2019. Was it did got a lot of uh, um, um, headliners. Um, I think another thing that uh, contributes to that those frostbites are standing that in that uh, cold uh, line to get to the summit for hours. I think that's also pretty much contributing to the whole thing. And thank you for listening to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Karki. Those are some great pictures. They, they were kind of nasty, but, but I liked them. <laughs> Those are awesome. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, Dr. Carell, do you have another case for us? I know we're, we're running just a little bit over, but these have been some yeah. great cases. And thank you for everyone who stuck around. Um, yes, I have got one more case. Okay, great. Yeah. 
Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. I love your okay. yak. Yeah. So this is a picture just to show you that uh, this is outside of our clinic. Uh, we just don't always get a patient. Sometimes we get yaks as a visitor as well. <laughs> so these yaks were there to bring us some of our foods from uh, from Namche. Okay. So let's begin with our case. Uh, this is a case of a 45 year old male. Uh, he was he's a Nepalese climber, uh, planning to go to summit uh, Everest this season, uh, and he was a non Sherpa. So I must focus here is that uh, Sherpas usually don't get uh, the incidence of high altitude sickness in Sherpas is quite less. So that's why I need to focus here is that he was a non Sherpa, and he uh, and he was planning to do a summit uh, on that season. And before doing a season, he did a acclimatization, acclimatization climb to a peak around 6,500 meters, and he had no any significant past medical history. So uh, he, he, visit, uh, he visited our clinic on the second day of arrival of our base camp. Uh, he, he had chief complaint of uh, he had shortness of breath. Uh, he was unable to lie on supine, and he had cough. And the cough was initially dry, and then it gradually became productive. And he had no headache and the vomiting. And so when he came, uh, he had brought his cough as well. Uh, uh, so as you can see here, the cough is quite reddish. And so when some people get this kind of cough, we did a spot diagnosis of a hip and what's a high altitude pulmonary edema. And then we did an examination. And on examination, his saturation was 50, uh, 55 to 60 around. And a significant thing is we could hear uh, chest crackles all around his chest. So we made a diagnosis of high altitude pulmonary edema. And then uh, he was in the evening, so that's why we gave him oxygen via face marks, and and his saturation was maintained at 90 and 91. And then we gave him selenafil 50 mg. So I must mention that uh, in the season of 2021, uh, there was shortage of nifedipine in Kathmandu. We cannot get nifedipine anywhere around Kathmandu, so that's why we had to use selenafil at the time. And we prescribed him selenafil 50 mg, and then we advised him to go down. And Patient was evacuated to Kathmandu by helicopter and he stayed in a uh, hospital in, for two days. So when he was in the hospital, uh, he had regular contact with us uh, because he wanted to come back again to climb, uh, uh, come back again to climb Everest uh, because he thinks that he has invested a lot of money and a lot of time. He has invested uh, years of earnings and he has planning for the summit since uh, one year. So that's why anyhow he wanted to come back again. But we advise him to not to come back uh, to have this plan for the next year. But uh, but the, unfortunately, the patient came back again after 10 days. Uh, he was discharged from the hospital, and the next day, he, he, he then flight, took a flight to Lukla, and then he came back in the 10 days. He came back to base camp again. And on arrival, uh, he met with us, and we asked him if he had got any symptoms. So he said that uh, he had no anti-reactive symptoms, and uh, on the next day, he did uh, some walk around the base camp and did some ice climbing in the uh, in the base camp area as well with his guide. And at the, on the third day at the base camp, uh, then he was planning to go to camp one and camp two for the rotation. And, uh, and before he went to camp, uh, before he went, uh, before, uh, before the evening, uh, he just visited our clinic just for a general checkup. He wanted us to look at him if he, if he had got any symptoms. So we just do the general examination. He had no any symptoms. He had no headache, no shortness of breath. But while I oscillated his chest, I could see uh, hear some crackles. So even though he had not no any symptoms, I could hear crackles very clearly. And his saturation was 60, 65. And he had no difficulty while climbing as well. So even though he had no any symptoms, so we said that you had got some fluid in your lungs, so you cannot go up. And then the patient insisted that he had no any symptoms. I, I don't have any shortness of breath, uh, so I can go up. He thinks that he can climb up easily. But we asked him not to go up because there is tension to his life. So you can hear some fluid in his lungs. And since the patient was reluctant to go up, we talked to his guide about the danger of going up. Even the guides asked him to stop the climbing, but he didn't agree with us. And he wanted to go up again. And on the evening of the same day, that he was planning to go up at 9 or 10 in the evening, uh, leaving the base camp to the camp one. And suddenly, he started developing shortness of breath while he was on his uh, dining tent. And he called us. And he said, when we, while we measured his saturation was 50-55, and he had productive cough. And... And then uh, we did an immediate treatment of high flow oxygen. And then we again gave him selenafil. And said it, since it was night, we kept on overnight oxygen. And we planned to evacuate the next morning. Um, so yeah, so this was a hate again for him. you know. So what we learned from this lesson is that uh, 
even though here this case in this case uh, this patient had already climbed 6300 meters before he came to base camp so the base camp is around 5300 meters so even though he went to 6300 meters before uh, this is always not productive for him uh, so we can be always be productive from hyaluronic pulmonary edema even though we have climbed a peak before so on the second chance when he came back again to the base camp so initially he didn't have any symptoms despite uh, even though we can hear some chest crackles so we so so what we learned from here, uh, what we learned from here is that uh, initially pulmonary edema doesn't always bring with symptoms. Sometimes it can be without any symptoms as well. So whenever someone comes for a regular checkup, we must auscultate his chest. You know? So initially, when he was in the morning, we he didn't have any symptoms of shortness of breath, but we could hear some chest crackles. So that's why uh, chest auscultation is one of the most uh, things we should not be avoid. Yeah, so this one, this is the case. Uh, I took a photo of him with consent over here. Uh, so he was waiting for a helicopter to go down. So he was not quite happy. He was quite sad because he had to abandon his, all his plan. And so, yeah, that's the case. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great case. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it sounds like it's really hard to have your patients be compliant up there when they've invested so much and they've yeah, planned yeah. and planned. It's sometimes they're, they're, they lose their good sense. <laughs> they don't make yeah. good decisions, it sounds like. Yeah. 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 Wow. So interesting case in this part was that he had already climbed 6,300 meters before to, as acclimatization, but when he came to base camp, even then he got hit. You know? so, so that was quite surprising for him as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Carell, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Peldel, um, Dr. Gamire, Dr. Karke. Um, you guys just, thank you so much. This was so great. Um, love to hear your cases and your experiences. Um, thank you for everyone that stuck around. Um, and now I would just like to, you know, for anybody who wants to hang around, I'd love to open the floor for questions, um, and just discussion. Anybody who, who has something to add or has some questions to ask. No. Right. Looks like there's a question in the chat, Jesse. Um, there's a question um, regarding whether the guides they can um, so do have they do they have like option of refusing to support clients who want to climb against medical advice. Uh, it's a pretty good question, and I think. Uh, it's something that that should be discussed, uh, <clears throat> but um, unfortunately, the majority of the decisions um, um, regarding climbing, who climbs and who does not, uh, does not come from the guide side. It's mostly the expedition manager who does uh, does decide that, and um, and I think it's uh, with all that um, um, all that. Uh, 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 work and and the money and the effort from the clients they put in, uh, I think the the expedition manager are always on the uh, kind of back foot uh, regarding what what they can take, uh, how much they can like um, be stern about uh, sending someone down. There are some, um, so uh, I think uh, this also helps us like define what would be a good climbing practice and also like uh, risky because uh, there are some pretty good uh, expedition uh, teams that would uh, send clients down just um, the, when they have uh, when they do not perform as good and if they are putting uh, their guides um, on danger or if they are too slow when they make their uh, hikes and they, they feel like these will not be okay to go up all the way to the summit. So there are some good teams that do take that uh, um, right and then uh, decide, decide to send them down, but also at the same time with the, the new teams and especially the Nepali uh, trekking, um, hiking, um, sorry, expedition team, they, they uh, are mostly um, trying to, um, be compliant with the guides and um, with the with the clients and just sometimes take a little too much of risks uh, regarding their needs and what the medical decision they can do. What do you feel, Prakash? Did you have similar uh, experience or different? Yeah, in this case, you know, the fortunately the guide was an international uh, international trained mountain guide. So he was trained medically and he was a professional guide. So that's why he was like quite 
so he was he, he was uh, he was telling his client that not to go up uh, otherwise he, uh, he wanted to take any risks so even though we had uh, because we had already made a paper that uh, he had a uh, hip so he was telling that the insurance would not cover him if he, if he need to get evacuated from the camp one or camp two so if someone needs to evacuate from camp one and camp two and if he had all, and he was going up there in a drop without doctor's advice against the doctor advice so the cost will be around 60000 to 70000 us dollars so for evacuation uh, which will not be covered by the insurance so that's why um, uh, so that's why uh, the guide was telling him not to go up so that was the other reason uh, even, even though even the guide was saying the, the client was reluctant to go up even though that he was saying that he can go up all those things sometimes it depends on the client as well yeah But in this case, uh, the guide was uh, agreeing to go up uh, by signing a high risk consent on the, in this case. Yeah, because uh, even if a patient, if a client dies up in the altitude, uh, he thinks that it will be uh, like uh, quite the same for the uh, for same for the guide as well. Because in next year, if someone knows that the client with the guide has died, so the next client won't like to go with the guide. So that's why the guide would not like someone ill patient up in the mountain. So that's why the guide was not. Uh, so he was not uh, coping with with him to go up, and he was trying to for the client to stay up in the base camp. So it's a quite a tricky situation, actually. Yeah, it sounds like. Yeah. Any other any other questions for our doctors? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I have something to add, if I may. Absolutely, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is Dr. Bivishin Thapa. Um, I, I, I have an experience of uh, serving in high altitude clinic. I served as a volunteer doctor for Himalayan Rescue Association at Manang Health Aid uh, last fall season. And uh, I want to add to uh, the uh, cases uh, that Dr. Pawan just explained about. I had similar case uh, that is related to I, and we as a high altitude doctors, uh, I think I myself was very ill prepared for uh, like uh, dealing with such conditions. I had a case of a 38 years guide, Nepalese guide, who was accompanying a very, um, uh, I, I like to describe him as a very gentleman from uh, Israel. And uh, what he developed was he developed transient loss of vision, transient painless loss of vision, and it was it was multiple episode. Like he was uh, tr ascending from the Thorang Fedi, which was uh, in al which is in altitude of four thousand four hundred meter plus, and he was ascending to Thorangla. Uh, so uh, when was when he was. When was he? Uh, when he was few um, hours away from 4,400 meters, he developed transient loss of vision, and uh, then uh, it he, uh, it was spotted by the uh, Israeli guy, and he brought the he he brought the uh, guy to our health clinic at Manang, that is in 3,800 meters uh, height, and he did not have any other symptoms except the transient loss of vision and he used to have transient loss of vision of like five to ten seconds sometimes in both eye sometimes in one eye and not in other eye and it was going on for like two three hours and there was no other symptoms we rule out hape we rule out haze we rule out uh, like um, symptoms of stroke and we did everything we could do and uh, we also did uh, ophthalmoscopic examination. Uh, we do not have dilators, so we did it anyway. And I could appreciate a retinal hemorrhage, huge retinal hemorrhage in his right eye, um, but not in left. And um, the patient had self-medicated with steroid while he was coming down. And uh, we gave him estrozolamide, we gave him oxygen for a bit, and we consulted our professors of 
of ophthalmology because I was not uh, prepared for this case and I had very little knowledge about this case. And yeah, they too um, suggested us the same oxygen therapy, acetazolamide, and uh, and asked him to descend and descend down and um, help uh, like seek help from the tertiary care in Kathmandu or uh, any nearby city. And yeah, that was the case. And uh, I was totally ill prepared for the case, but it was a very interesting case indeed. And I, I followed up him uh, like after a month, but sadly he did not go for follow up in Kathmandu. And, but the symptom resolved uh, um, itself because of uh, what he did not go to check up in the Kathmandu. Uh, it was a very interesting case indeed. And for like high altitude doctors like us, we should be uh, very vigilant about uh, this type of scenario, I guess. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was a really interesting case. Um, so did you say, mm -hmm. do you know, he did he regain his vision or he was lost to follow up? Is that what you said? Uh, he, uh, like the vision loss was transient. Um, he had it for like a couple of hours and uh, as he descended from like 4,400 meters to 3,800 meters uh, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the village of Manang, uh, I think that much descent was uh, okay or because the uh, condition that led uh, him uh, to have that symptoms resolved on his own. He did not have uh, symptoms. He spent a, day, a, a night in Manang and the symptoms resolved the next day. He did not have that symptoms when he descended from Manang, but he, uh, but uh, unfortunately he did not go for uh, follow-up in Kathmandu uh, for his eye checkup. And um, yeah, because of that, I do not have much information about what was the condition. But yes, I did see big retinal hemorrhage in his right eye but um, there was uh, similar symptoms in his left eye as well. So um, I do not know what the condition is actually, but uh, it might be the case of high altitude retinopathy or something. Thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah, we have an interesting question um, 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 regarding Everest. Uh, does he uh, go by Sagarmatha? So yeah, it it is called Sagarmatha in Nepali. Uh, it it literally means uh, the one whose head is the the sky. So because of that uh, attitude, um, it literally has its head in the sky. So it's it's like the the one that has the head of the sky. <laughs> that I means. Love that. Uh, yeah that's that's what we call my son too <laughs> yeah, that's great yeah. beautiful and it's is called so, in, that's in right Tibetan. that's the other yeah, yeah, yeah. chumalungmas and, that, and is that uh, tibetan is that the tibetan yeah. it's the tibetan yeah. version and i think it means okay. the um, um mother god of the mountains or oh, wow. maybe the roof of the earth isn't the problem i'm not sure but i i heard some it's called the roof of the earth Roof of the earth. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. This is it, for any of you who haven't been to this part of the world. It's one of the most special places on earth. It's just amazing. I really encourage you if you ever get a chance to go there, please, please, um, you know, take that opportunity. Um, we're hoping at Virginia Tech, we're hoping to start making trips to Nepal again, um, tentatively in um, April of 2020. Please get a hold of me if you're interested. We, um, everybody from medical students to attendings is welcome, um, and everything in between. So, so please, please reach out um, if you have interest. I'll put my email in the um, in the comment section. But there's Dr. Abiu again. He's back. Thank you again for for um, for your presentation and for your time. And um, if, if nobody has any other questions, I'll, I'll let you all go about your evening, but I just, I can't thank you enough for, for making this a, a great program. And hopefully this is something we can do on a yearly basis and um, continue to let it grow. And hopefully we'll have a little better communication with um, Everest DR in real time, but we, it was good to see some videos and, and hear from your all's experiences. So thank you so much.
Uh, thank you. I have a request uh, for Dr. Jesse. Uh -huh. uh, if if uh, baby Everest is uh, somewhere near, would it be okay to see him? <laughs> let me let me holler out the door. Zach just took off with him, but I bet you I bet you he can bring him back. I'll, give me one second. I'm, I know he would love to say hi to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. All right. So his dad, his dad put him in a backpack and took off into the woods with him. <laughs> but he's, um, he'll be back in a minute. I know he wants to say hi to you if you guys are still here. But um, yeah. other, the other ones of you, if you if have other things to do, please, please go about your business. But um, I know Everest still like to say hi to his, no. his poly uncles. <laughs> <laughs> We had it. Uh, this was a. I'm. I'm really pleased with how many people showed up. This was really nice. Uh, today, uh, I mean, this time around, uh, compared to last year, I think we had we had a better turnout. Oh yeah, yeah. I think so. I can't remember what the numbers were last year, but I know it was a lot more. I think we almost had seventy people at one point. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So are you staying staying really busy in Namche? Yeah, it's it's uh, extremely busy nowadays. Uh, last three days, if uh, if I would add all the hours of sleep I've had, then it would be less than three. <laughs> oh no! Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's not healthy. It's a busy, busy week, but it's nice. It's uh, action packed. Yeah, so it's still <laughs> single coverage there, right? You're the you're the only doc in town. Yeah. So yeah, but but we have uh, we have five staff. So uh, we go up and down, go to Dingboche, and then back here. So mm -hmm. we were at Dingboche about a month ago, and now now back here. It's it's nice. <laughs> That's really cool. They have a they have a clinic in Dingboche now. That's a um, where in town is uh, it? Is it um, is it associated with one of the hostels or is it the freestanding building? Uh, no, it's uh, it actually belonged to uh, uh, Osona Hishi, so he passed away due to COVID. Oh no! And uh, yeah, it's, it's right at the center of Dingboche. And okay. uh, he was the one who who gave me this uh, yak head. So he uh, he was a yak herder. Oh no! I remember the and, yak head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Abhu has great interior decorating. <laughs> I have seen that yak. That's too monstrous yak head, you know. <laughs> yeah, a big one. <laughs> and I was quite surprised to know that how how did you manage to bring it to Kathmandu? You know, how did you pass the yak? <laughs> you managed to bring it to Kathmandu. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just here, yeah, I have got one more interesting case. If there's time, can I take do a brief two or three presentation about an interesting case of leprosy? That's not in a base camp, but yeah, I mean anybody who yeah, yeah I would I would love to yeah. hear about it. Anybody sure, else yeah. who's uh, okay. wanting right. to listen? That's awesome. So yeah, can you see the my slide? Yeah. Okay. So this case have not this this is a case of not of the base camp but of the Machermo. Uh, if anyone knows about Machermo, it's in the way to, not in the Kumu Trail. It's in the way to Gokyo, uh, Gokyo Lake. So there is a Machermo Valley, and there was a clinic called IPPG Rescue Post, uh, International Portal Protection Group. Uh, I worked there uh, two months as a volunteer doctor uh, on year 2019, and that's when I met Jesse as well and all the team on the way. So yeah. So there was a case of a one Sherpa, 60, 60 plus year Sherpa. He was staying alone. And he used to come to our clinic with a complaint of bilateral knee joint pain. And uh, even though he was just there to get some painkillers for his knee joint. So when he came to our clinic, uh, even though there was a uh, knee joint pain, but we could see that he had some kind of other things going around in his body. So he had lost two of his digits in his hand. So he had unhealed also in his left hand since one year. There was no, there were no eyebrows that we, what we call malarosis, and he had loss of sensation in his bilateral wrist. You know? And so, so you can see here. So you can see here he had lost his digits. See, he had a chronic ulcer over here. So 
so he was not worried about his symptoms because you know he had no sensation it was painless ulcer over there and he had no sensation about this year and when i examined his face uh, there were no eyebrows as well and so so unfortunate thing is that he could not speak nepali neither he could speak english all the thing he could speak was just sherpa and we doctors i was one nepalese doctor and there were two british doctors so none of us could understand him neither of our manager could understand him so we were all talking with his all the sign languages so when he came to our clinic we just did a quite a dressing and get some pain plus for his knee pain and because this case was quite interesting so that's why i plan to visit his home uh, so so on the right you can see his home over there he used to live alone on on his, his area and uh, when we reached over in this area we called nearby people around there and when we asked about all his symptoms in detail so they said that he was left alone by uh, his son in his this area because they think that he has got some mysterious disease so this kind of mystery disease this things are this kind of this is some kind of god's curse okay and so that's why yeah he had, the family had left him in his alone house so so this so yeah so this was a clinical diagnosis of a uh, leprosy we think because all the signs and symptoms were quite matching with the leprosy so we asked his cousin brothers who were living around to take him to the hospital but uh, the this patient didn't want to go down and so yeah and so that's why he is all living there with leprosy right now he is not going down as well we cannot do any clinical test because we don't have any clinical test to do up there in high in the mountains but all the clinical signs and symptoms were all matching up to the leprosy and he had lots of disease and everything so this is quite interesting case you know we we can see some tropical case up there in mountain so yeah we did just did a clinical diagnosis and we cannot do any confirmation you know that's the case yeah that's wild oh my gosh did yeah. he have any sick contacts did anybody else any other cases of leprosy in the area that no really no we uh, we asked family history all the thing you know, with his uh, with, with his uh, uh, nephew but he said that no no one had got similar symptoms so he, he was single case only and he was left alone in the, in that uh, in the south by his family because he, they think that he had got some mysterious disease very interesting i've never seen leprosy before that's wild yeah this was the first time for me as well in the altitude well everest everest finally showed up to say hello it's cold yeah, here I, this morning I, I, not as cold as at everest base camp but it's chilly but everest here's all my friends say hi <laughs> say <Hello>. hi this <laughs> is beautiful oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> Someday we'll bring him up to the Kumbu. He's got to get a little yeah, bigger. Yeah. <laughs> but no. Oh. You say hi. Oh, he says his dada so far. No mama, just dada. He's dada's boy. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Yeah. Well, well, thank you guys so much. Any any yeah. other uh, thoughts, questions? You see, uh, I'd like to share one case. Uh, Am I heardable? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be fine. Thank you. So during my stay at Everest, um, I I examined a man uh, who presented to ER with uh, very severe pain on his uh, calf, you know, and um, when I examined, like it was a bit uh, swollen, as well as on, um, and when I asked him about the history. Uh, he said that uh, he had uh, that pain for I think ten days, you know. And despite pain, he was uh, taking analgesic on his own, and um, he decided to go um, go to like camp camp one, and then he came back, and it was still the pain was still there. And again, he went to halfway to camp two, and uh, uh, despite uh, so much counseling from his guide, uh, he was uh, like he was reluctant to obey him, you know. And he was like so much uh, crazy about, I think, <laughs> to submit the Everest. So on the way, midway to uh, camp two, he couldn't walk. That is how he returned back. And uh, finally, he came to um, the clinic, you know, uh, to um, visit. And uh, I looked and I suspected it to be the ben thrombosis. Uh, however, he had no other symptoms like um, like shortness of breath or um, any other. Only he had, he had pain on his uh, um calf and uh, i evacuated him immediately and uh, so i followed him for uh, some time and uh, so yes it turned out to be um, uh, the you know the ben thrombosis 
So I'd like to say like, uh, like sometimes, you know, when we are in a high altitude and we have some dream or we have some mission to fulfill and despite our health, sometimes maybe patients, they become so reluctant to follow the advice and they are so much uh, into submitting the Everest or submitting, doing their work. And uh, it's really hard uh, to convince the patient at that time. So that's uh, all about my experience with one of the patient. Oh, thank, thank you for the case. Yeah. I mean, there is, it, there is an increased risk of thrombosis at high altitude, right? Yeah. So it's not, um, thank you for, thank you for telling us about that. Any, any questions for Sangeeta or any other, any other things you guys would like to discuss before we wrap up? Looks like someone asked in the chat, did he have uh, risk factors? Did, did you happen to hear that, Sangeeta? Do you know if he had risk factors for DVT? So uh, in him, you know, he had no, so no any significant past history that is suggestive of uh, uh, to cause the band thrombosis, but uh, you know, Altitude itself is a risk factor as uh, there is increased hematopoiesis, as well as we, we get dehydrated, there is more stress in that condition, I think. That was um, itself a predisposing factor, but he didn't have any significant uh, relevant history. Uh, hello, everyone. Again, um, our, my question is to Dr. Sangita itself. So, uh, here working in Kathmandu, we also use um, something called uh, well scoring uh, when it comes to mm -hmm. thromboembolic events like DBT. Also, like, okay. did you use the scale or any other scale um, to like uh, clinically judge the uh, condition of the patient? Uh, yes, uh, yes, we, can, uh, we used the Wells uh, scoring system there because we didn't have any other uh, investigation tools and his score was more than two. That's what I remember. Uh, so there was pain and there was swelling and uh, there was risk factor that is at a high altitude. So we used it. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sangta. So I, uh, I want to add something, if I may. <laughs> So um, sure, sure. in Manang, when, when I was in Manang, uh, we had a similar condition, but it was not DVT. It was pulmonary embolism. So it was a case of mm -hmm. uh, 50, uh, 48 years female from Slovenia. Uh, uh, she had a few risk factors and uh, she presented with acute onset of severe breathlessness. So she did not have any other history, um, uh, sorry, other complaints, but acute onset of uh, severe breathlessness. And she was a regular tracker. Uh, she was a regular tracker and she had been to Manang and every season several times. Uh, she did not have other uh, like uh, symptoms like haze or we all, all even rule out, we kind of rule out uh, hip um, and uh, when uh, calculating the well score for pulmonary embolism it was more than four and and because of that uh, we uh, gave her uh, like um, an oxyparin and uh, uh, and heli lifted her to Kathmandu and in Kathmandu they did a workup for uh, pulmonary embolism and the didymo was quite high very high 4.5 if I'm not wrong uh, but uh, luckily uh, the CPA scan was clean and after a few days of stay at hospital she was discharged and she's uh, well and good now so that was my experience so um, in a high altitude, we do not have a very sophisticated investigation. And what we have is um, clinical um, clinical examinations and a clinical knowledge. That is what we have. And scoring like well scoring is very helpful um, 
I guess for like clinical evaluation of the patient when we are in sort of um, uh, diagnostic equipment. Yeah, that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's a good thing for all of us in the U.S. to think about because we're pretty spoiled with having um, a lot of diagnostic testing available and we use a lot of the same clinical decision rules, but they're typically on whether we're going to test or get the test, not on whether we're going to treat. So um, it's it's really interesting to see how they can kind of be applied in both directions and definitely applaud your work because it's not easy. Yeah, actually, indeed. Um, I'm based in Kathmandu and right now uh, as well, I'm in Kathmandu. Uh, we have all the sophisticated um, equipments to assist the case and uh, to reach to the diagnosis. But uh, I had a similar practice here before I went to Manang and it was very difficult for me to just rely on a clinical assessment for the diagnosis of the patient and to reach to the diagnosis and, um, and to provide treatment. But uh, eventually, that is all what we had there, uh, then and there. And uh, yeah, I uh, I feel quite confident now to just rely on my clinical examinations and clinical knowledge uh, for the uh, for the treatment and diagnosis. Yeah, that is what I learned from uh, my voluntary experience in uh, in the high altitude sickness, and I'm quite happy and proud of it. I guess. <laughs> yeah, we all get. Uh... We have um, uh, a new CT scanner installed in one of the small hospitals where I worked. And when it was out for a while, it, it definitely changed your perspective and changed your thought process. Because if you wanted to scan, you'd have to send the patient, you know, via ambulance to another hospital, you know, 45 minutes away. And that was in the height of COVID when it was all the hospitals were very full. So you definitely learn to rely more on clinical judgment, which is something I think we don't do a great job of doing a lot in the U.S. because everyone just likes to order the next test. We're definitely all guilty. I think I think it's a if you compare a clinical practice to doing maths, I think we can draw a, an interesting uh, analogy. Uh, it's it's like uh, you can do simple calculations in your head, but if you have a calculator, then then you cannot. I mean, you lose that ability to uh, calculate, and and there are certain calculations that you need a calculator for, right? Uh, so I'm not saying calculators are not important, but uh, if you get used to using a calculator, then you, you lose the ability to, you know, like do calculations in your head. So I think it's, it's a similar, uh, similar phenomenon. Yeah, that's a great analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree. I think we're uh, very calculator bound here, which uh, <laughs> but it, it's fun. It's, you know, just like it's fun to do math in your head. It's it's also fun to really step back and, and think. And I think that's for a lot of us, what draws us to wilderness medicine is getting to use clinical skills and improvise and make it a little bit more exciting than just, you know, clicking buttons on the computer to have more tests done. Yeah. <laughs> of you working uh, in Namche for six years, I think he has been a very good calculator. <laughs> <laughs> it needs no investigation, I think. Uh, uh, I, think yeah, I hope so, that. but but there are some calculations, like I said before, that that cannot be done in your head. <laughs> so I mean, calculators are important. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed, it has has talked to all the. Work all the volunteer doctors and doctors working in high altitude were uh, like calculated, calculated less, but yet doing a wonderful job. Uh, yeah, yes, calculator gives you a certain uh, confidence level and accuracy of diagnosing and treating. Uh, but uh, I think uh, clinical diagnosis and clinical assessment um, is such a wonderful thing that we are like missing on we are missing on um because like uh, with that you can put together things that you learned in your medical school and uh, come with the differential diagnosis come with the provisional diagnosis and go on with the treatment of the patient um i really love the experience of that <laughs> go on what do you think your classmates will uh, do if uh, jesse and i come to work and say oh we're not going to do any tests we're just going to use clinical judgment <laughs> they can handle it 
No, he may not have heard us. I, I think it would be complete chaos. It's Wilderness Medicine Month for all our residents. And I think that would be a really good tactic, Steph. We'll just say, okay, no diagnostics, physical exam only. Here you go. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. Uh, was it something? Oh, I said, um, how, how do you think your classmates would feel if Jesse and I came to work and said, we're not going to do any diagnostic tests anymore. We're going to use clinical judgment to take care of the, you know, millions of patients. I think, I think we should do that in the waiting room. So half of the patients leave the waiting room and, you know, we can, <laughs> yeah, I think if our patients don't get the test, then probably half of them won't like <laughs> be happy and just leave home and it'll be slightly easier. <laughs> But yeah, sure. I think we all want uh, to go to the tunnel of truth. Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, it's always uh, good to have those tools in hand, and it's uh, it's it saves a lot of uh, time and energy and effort, and uh, gives much uh, benefit. But at the same time, uh, uh, having that physical examination and clinical suspicion is probably uh, something that always is uh, extra strength uh, in medicine and I, I, I really appreciate um, uh, those who've been working in the rural areas especially Nepal because uh, I also also worked in such environment and it's pretty challenging but um, I think uh, um, it's it's a definitely a very different practice here and uh, I think the, the thing that's most beneficial was this uh, it saves a lot of time and um, saves a lot of uh, misdiagnosis and uh, not being able to diagnose or such things and that's that's helpful as well all right well guys thank you so much for spending um the morning in the u.s or the evening in nepal with us this was this was a this was a lot of fun and hopefully we'll be able to do it again next year. And um, if you have any suggestions for, you know, what we could do better next year, besides maybe manage the time zones a little bit better on my end, <laughs> um, please put them in the comments. We'd love to continue to improve and have this be something that we do on a yearly basis. So, all right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting right, us. You. And uh, it was a great session.